Thank you, everybody, and welcome. Uh, sorry about the short delay, but we are here. I am extremely excited to be joined by David S. Rose today. David and I have been working together for more than a decade. Uh, this was going to be the, the capstone of our Founder Prepare series that we've been running for the last couple of weeks. It's the end of the year. People have uh, ideas that, you know, well, people have had ideas in their heads for their whole lives. But thinking about starting a company, we've been focusing a lot of our programming on the preparatory steps of what you should educate yourself on uh, before jumping into the deep end and starting a startup and starting a company. And we've done stuff all about market validation and finances. Uh, but this is probably going to be the most engaged. We have 142 people here, but we've got David here to talk about the 101 of the fundraising process. A lot of people approach this stuff backwards where they're like, oh, I have this great idea. Why doesn't somebody give me a million dollars to run after it? And that's actually usually the opposite direction that you want to approach it. So educating yourself about what is the fundraising process? What kind of funding can go into companies of many different sizes? Uh, I can't think of a better person to run us through this than David himself, because he has a huge amount of experience on pretty much every side of the table of this and even a perspective onto completely different tables, tables that we don't even deal with day to day, as in companies that are not high growth startups going after angel investing, but a bunch of other things. So David can talk faster than me, knows so much more than me. So I'm going to hand it over to him uh, in just a bit. But uh, knowing David's uh, kind of flow, we're going to save Q&A to the end of this. So use the Q&A features, use the chat, submit questions. We will have time for them at the end. Uh, but I'm going to let David just, just rip through it uh, to the beginning. And if there's anything, I might interrupt him once or twice, but it's a difficult thing to do. Uh, but without further ado, David, take it away. Thank you, Ryan. Hey, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as Ryan says, I'm going to go just riff for probably close to uh, my full lot of hour here, but then I promise to stay on and we'll field questions that people put in the chat and ask live later. So this is all about funding 101. If you are a startup founder, you probably watch shows like Shark Tank and Silicon Valley and all these things and have an interesting view of the way the world works. But if you're starting out a company for the first time and you really you, you realize that you need cash, um, you probably have no clue as to where to start, how to get it. What are these things called VCs or angels? Can you go to a bank? Are there grants? All that kind of stuff. And so the goal today is to walk through the whole process from beginning to end, from the kind of company to the kinds of financing that are available, to who the financing comes from, how you reach them, how you pitch what you're doing. Uh, and then once you got that, how you structure the actual investment. It's going to be a lot of stuff to include. And this is probably, oh, a good third to a half of my book, The Startup Checklist, if any of you have read that. Um, but uh, take notes. This will be recorded. You'll be able to um, follow up afterwards. There will be links in the show notes. For this, so you'll be able to uh, follow all kinds of things that I'm going to be talking about, as well as tools on Gust and other kinds of resources. All right. The first thing to understand before you do anything else is that financing is coming to a business, it's to your company. And it's not because you're cute or because you know somebody. It's all about coming to the company. And there are two completely different kinds of companies. And this is something that often gets lost in the mix when people are talking about how to do a startup or startup funding. There are two paths equally valid, but for two very different kinds of businesses. And those kinds of businesses are the small independent business, the typical business you see on the street, and this thing that we know of as a high growth startup. And those two things, it's not just a difference in scale, it's a difference in fundamental kind. And the interesting thing is that while you hear all this stuff in the paper about uh, you know, high growth startups and funding and uh, Shark Tank and so on, in reality, over 90% of the businesses that get started in America are actually traditional independent small businesses. These are everything from your graphic design studio, your local accounting firm, a coffee shop, a yoga studio, a hardware store. Um, these are a craft studio. These are many, many, many of the kinds of businesses that you interact with on a daily basis. The other group, which are these high growth startups, account for only 10% or so of all the companies that get started, maybe even less than that. Um, and they have a very different kind of financing uh, perspective and a very different kind of growth track over time. So first of all, before we get into money, how to get it, where to get it, and what to do to get it, um, let's figure out which of these two businesses you are, right? So to start with, if you are a solo founder, you're, you're, you're one person, you're starting a company, um, typically the small independent business will operate from a physical location. 
either because it's a retail location like a hardware store or a coffee shop, or it's your studio or you're working out of your office. And there's typically a location. These aren't virtual kinds of companies. Um, these have generally relatively few, few employees, typically under 10 employees. If you think about the number of employees you'd have in a bakery or a retail store, you're not gonna have tons and tons of, you're not McDonald's, tons and tons of things. Um, the interesting thing about these employees is they will likely not have equity. These will be salaried employees who you will pay a salary for either an hourly basis or weekly or annual salaries, but they're not gonna have equity in your business. Um, and but once you get this started with these employees, um, you will often be able to make money, start making money day one. If you think about opening a bodega, right? Once you rent the place and you stock it up with the things in the bodega, the minute your first customer comes in and buys a banana for more than you paid for it, the store is making money. And so typically these small independent businesses start pretty quickly generating revenue and generating profitable revenue which means that because of that, because they are actually generating revenue pretty quickly, you're often able to get bank financing for it, get a bank loan for the business on the basis of the fact that you're now making money. Um, that being said, these businesses get to start pretty quickly, but they typically have some natural cap as to how big they can grow. And typically, um, these businesses, you know, will rarely get over a million or so in revenue a year. They might, and there are, you know, quite a few independent businesses um, that were not funded externally uh, that can get up to millions of revenue. But typically, revenues will be in the hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, initially hundreds of thousands, ultimately. And the goal here for why you do this is to, is to self-actualize, to have a great company, to support yourself, to support your family. And this is typically a business that you will spend much of your working life in doing. And it may be derogatorily called a lifestyle business. There's nothing wrong with that at all. It's supporting your business, your lifestyle, your family. And because of that, as an ongoing thing, you're not looking to have an exit. You're not trying to do an IPO for your, for your coffee shop. Um, these are businesses that will be an ongoing thing, a fulfilling, successful, income-generating business for you. And that accounts for the majority of all businesses that are started in the country and in the world. The other kind of business, however, and the one that Gus tends to focus on, and my guess is that quite a few of you on the call may be starting, is this high-growth startup, right? And so typically, while there are single founder high growth startups, most founders, most startups that we see have a founding team of two or more co-founders because there's a lot of stuff to be done um, and a lot of craziness. And it often is very helpful to have two people with complementary skills. Um, these businesses tend to grow pretty fast and get pretty big, which means that they will often have more than 10 employees, not day one, but by you know day five, day you know day one hundred, um, you're going to be bulking up employees relatively quickly compared to a small independent business. And one of the features of these kinds of high growth startups is that everybody is going to have equity, down to the receptionist, down to every coder, will end up having equity in your business, meaning it's owning a piece of the company because they're taking a big risk on this risky business, uh, and part of the compensation is the ownership that they have in the business. Um, because of the scale, because the business is going to get pretty big and is going to need to feed the kitty before you get going, um, often these businesses, not almost always, um, require outside investors. Uh, and so outside investors means you all of a sudden have other people to be responsible for, um, too, and not just you. So because these outside investors are looking for a big payday, you are ultimately going to be thinking big, very, very big. Um, because this company, to return the profit that investors are looking to make, as well as keep going, has to be big. And that often means global. In this day and age of the internet, every business can be global. Um, and uh, that means you're going to be growing and growing and growing until you get there. Because the goal is your equity is coming from your ownership in the business. That means you need to focus on the business and not on your job. And this is an interesting thing for many people to get their heads around. Whereas if it's your business and you own the whole thing and you are running your, your coffee shop or studio, it's your business. The minute you start getting into one of these global growing, high growth businesses, your focus has to be on the company and not the job. And what that means is that if pretty soon, early on into your founder journey, you realize that you don't have the skill set or you're not the right person to 
to start this company, that means you will replace yourself or you will be replaced by somebody. And that's good for you because ultimately you'll make your money as the company grows, not from your personal salary. And because of that, the way that you make money from these high growth companies is when they get sold, when they have an exit, when somebody else buys them, either the public markets um, who were individual people buy shares of stock or buy investors or mergers and acquisitions. Um, it's a different kind of business. And so these two types of businesses, the independent business and the high growth startup, are they are literally apples and oranges. They are completely different things, different financing is available, different trajectories. And it's really important to not delude yourself when you get started as to what kind of business you're starting. Nothing wrong with starting either one. But if you start um, a, a local coffee shop, for example, and go spend all your time trying to raise venture capital for a coffee shop, it's not going to work. It's like trying to teach the pig to sing. Um, you know, you're not going to get it, be successful, and all you'll do is annoy the pig. And so, if you basically spend, you know, your whole life trying to raise capital for a business that is will never, ever, ever be able to raise capital, it's just going to be frustrating. On the flip side is if you are starting a business that can get to revenues and profitability day one, you'll do it lean and mean, and you'll be able to get going and you'll own the whole thing. So therefore, if you have one of these small independent businesses, think about the core nature of the business. What is, what is that mean? What is the essence in terms of financing about this business? Well, first of all, the amount of money that you will need to grow is relatively modest. You're not starting Amazon or Apple or something. You're starting a hardware store or you're starting a pancake shop or something, right? And so relatively modest amounts of cash are needed. And the business, because it starts generating profits from day one, revenue over, over your costs, can ultimately support financing. You can raise money for this because the business itself will be throwing off capital. And then, because it's not going to be funded by outside investors, all of the financing risk is on your shoulders. That's your money, your personal credit, you're taking out a bank loan, you're getting a loan for the company for which you are co-signing, you are guaranteeing uh, that, that it will be, be paid back. And so therefore, what this means is here are your, your options for financing this type of traditional independent business, okay? One, the most historically uh, typical way of doing this is by friends and family. This is the traditional barn raising where an entire town comes and, and helps grow your thing, where family saves their money and cousins and, and siblings put in money to help your business grow, and then you pay them back. So for the after individual founder funding only, the most common form of funding for businesses, for, for new businesses, is from friends and family all chipping in to help your business get started. <clears throat> but once you have this business up and running and there are actual revenues, you now may well be able to go to a bank loan. And a bank loan, a bank will look at the business and say, okay, I see how you're making money, so you could pay back this loan. I want you to guarantee it, says the banker, but we will loan you money to do that. And if you have the kind of business that um, maybe can't qualify directly for a bank loan, but it is a viable business, the SBA, that's the Small Business Administration here in the U.S., has a program where they will guarantee to the bank that they will stand behind you for the loan. So that, that means the bank can, can go a little bit farther down the road um, uh, in terms of underwriting your loan than they could if it was a normal loan and they had to be responsible. So an SBA loan, you still have to personally guarantee it to the bank and the business has to hit some metrics, but that's designed to help small businesses get going. Um, there are credit unions who are sort of like banks, but credit unions have a little more flexibility and they can provide loans in different ways. They can provide loans, they can provide credit, uh, credit cards, credit lines, overdraft lines, um, ways that actually uh, can help fund the business. Um, then there are some things called small business grants and a grant is free money. A grant is somebody gives you money. And the people who give money to businesses are generally local. They're looking to help get small local businesses started. So they can be cities, they can be job assistance programs uh, within a city or a state. Um, they're very competitive because who doesn't like free money? Um, but you can look for them and they are there. And if the kind of business that you are doing is going to result in employment in the local community and the like and, and help the economy of your city, <coughs> these things are available. Um, then you have a relatively new addition to the operation over the last oh, five or 10 years is the idea of crowdfunding. And there are two types of crowdfunding. 
rewards-based crowdfunding is a typical Kickstarter or Indiegogo campaign. This is effectively pre-sale. You have an idea, you've done a prototype, you can show what you're doing, and effectively you pre-sell to people who are willing to take the risk that the product isn't finished yet, but you explain to them why you can do it, and they will take the risk of paying in advance for their product, and you can use that money to go and build the product. And this has helped launch a whole lot of interesting companies, a lot of interesting product companies over the last number of years. There's a second type of crowdfunding, however, and this is called equity crowdfunding. And equity crowdfunding is not a way to go out and get venture capital and the like. Equity crowdfunding is where people, anybody, literally regardless of how much income they have or how much wealth they have, is allowed by the uh, regulations to invest in equity and ownership shares of your company. Um, however, there are a lot of rules around it. And because these are very risky, pure startups raising small amounts of cash, these equity crowdfunding really works best if the people you are raising from already know and love and want to support you. And that typically means your customers, right? So if you have a business that has, you know, dozens or hundreds of customers who really love what you're doing and really want to help make sure your local comic shop or your local microbrewery or whatever um, is, is growing and will continue to be there, um, equity crowdfunding online through things like Start Engine and WeFunder and Republic will allow them to invest small amounts, a few thousands of dollars into your business. So these are the typical ways that you can raise money other than what's in your current checking account to help your small independent business get started. All right, that's what happens if you have this small independent soon to be profitable business. But what if not? What if you are trying to be Amazon or Apple or Google or something? What if you are trying to do a high growth startup? Well, then all of a sudden the game changes because now look at the guts of the company, right? Now you have a business that needs a lot of money. You have a business that is not making money day one because you're investing in developing the product or building out the things or getting your market share or whatever it is. And so you're not making money from the business day one. And because it's beyond the balance of your checkbook or, the, or anything you can sign for on a loan, you've got to turn to other people to fund this. And so now on the basis of those fundamentals, look at what we have. Because this path for this high growth business requires other people to go into their pocket and risk large amounts of their cash for a business that is currently losing money, <laughs> it turns out that surprise, surprise, this is actually very, very tough. It is a lot tougher than people think. If you just watch TV and you just watch Shark Tank, you know, oh, I've got a thing of a face mask that hunting and hummingbirds can, you know, eat off my face mask, which I saw last night on Shark Tank. Great, great episode. Um, you know, and people will just drop money into me. No, in the real world, that doesn't happen. Okay, so that's what we're going to spend much of the rest of the time um, today looking at for these high growth businesses where you're looking for outside capital, a big capital, and it's really tough to get what you need to do and where you get it. Okay, that's all the introduction. So now let's talk about fundraising and see where the funding comes from from these high growth businesses. Well, first up is, hey, free money. This is grants, grants for high growth businesses. And you say, what kind of grants are available? Why would a local you know, city give me a grant for my high growth business? And the answer is they won't. Um, the grants that you get for, or you may be able to get for this high growth business are a different kind of grant from the local economic development grant or small business grant. The grants that you, you may be able to get for your high tech, high growth business are grants from the SBIR, STTR program. This is a United States, if you're, this is, if, if you're in the US, a United States government program. Um, their tagline is America's Seed Fund, which basically is two uh, programs, two joint programs, the Small Business Innovation Research Program program and the Small Business Technology Transfer uh, Growth Program. And so what these do, every federal agency in the US that has a budget of more than X number of billions of dollars is required by law to give out these grants of free money to very, very new, very, very early companies that are doing something new and interesting and that might ultimately help American competitiveness and so on and so forth. Um, and the amounts here could be significant, right? The there, there are typically three phases of an SBIR uh, or SPTR grant program. The first phase is up to $2 
$250,000, a quarter of a million dollars um, for based on your idea and your plan and what you're trying to do uh, with the second phase after you've successfully proven that you can use the money and you've gotten somewhere where you thought you would get on your first phase, you can get a second phase of up to $750,000. So that's a million dollars you can get in a grant. And on the one hand, not every company um, uh, is eligible for these things. You're not, they're not gonna fund gaming companies or gambling things or sex toys or whatever it is. Each agency, there are 17 different agencies that have these programs. Um, NASA, the National Science Foundation, the military, um, the National Institute of Health and so on and so forth. And they put out a list of the areas in which they are looking to, to give grants for companies. Um, and if you're in one of those areas and doing something innovative, the odds are actually surprisingly good. It's about one in four. So you have about a 25% hit rate if the business that you're doing, you're proposing qualifies for those kinds of grants. So unfortunately, that is the beginning and end of free money for high growth startups. So now if that's not available, how do you get your company going? Well, I tell you, by far, absolutely positively, and every investor will tell you this, the best way to raise money after this, the best place to get it is not to get it. And that is to bootstrap your company. If you can bootstrap your company, which comes from pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps and using your own money and using you know, forward funding, paying, people paying for their uh, products before they get them so you can use the money. That's the way Apple Computer managed to, to get going. They bootstrapped, they got their first order from Apple Computers from a local computer shop. And with that order in hand, they then went out and got a loan to buy the parts that let them build the computers that they can actually um, go out and, and then sell. Uh, and so if there's any way you can not raise money and get the company going, that is by far the best way. Because what happens if you try and go to the bank, the kind of bank that would give a loan to that small independent business, the coffee shop or the hardware store that was actually generating revenue, the bodega day one? If you go to them and say, hey, I've got this great, amazing, high growth startup. We're going to be in the next Google. And isn't this wonderful? You know what the banker is going to tell you? Yeah because bankers are not in the business of taking risk. They do not, they're not betting on you. They're not betting on anybody. They're renting money. A banker will say, hey, here's the money, but you pay me the rent on this money of whatever the interest rate is, you know, 5% a year, 10% a year. And at the end of that year, you have to come back and give me back my money plus the interest on that money. And it doesn't matter whether you succeeded or failed. If you turned it into Google, good for you. Congratulations, you can buy me lunch. But you know what, if you tried and failed and the whole thing fell apart, I'm sorry, but you still have to pay me back all the money you borrowed plus the interest. And so um, banks do not take risks. Okay, so if you can't get free money and you're out of money yourself and you can't get money from a bank, where do you go? Well, that's what this is all about. And that's how you raise money because the next thing up is to raise equity. And raising equity essentially means selling part of your company, trading ownership in your company for the cash needed to grow the company. So if that's the goal to trade cash for ownership in the company, where is the first, who is the first person who puts in cash in exchange for ownership in the company? And if you say Elon Musk, the answer is no, unless your name is Elon Musk because the first person to put cash in is you. Every single founder who is looking to raise money from somebody else must, absolutely underline must, put in their own cash into the business. And it's not a question of how much cash you put in. It's a question of how meaningful that cash is to you. Because if you don't put your own cash, if you're not willing to risk your own money, money that you could use to take a vacation or um, buy a new car or something, if you're not willing to risk that money yourself, on your company, why would anybody else want to do it? And the answer is they wouldn't. So the first cash in is your is your own cash. Okay, what if you've been through all of your own cash? You got something started here. There's the beginnings of a little nubble of a business over here. Who's who do you turn to next? Well, traditionally, this would be your friends and family round, where people are, are investing in this business. They're all getting a piece of ownership in the business, not alone, but they're getting an ownership in the business. On, a, on the come, on a fly, because they love you. They respect you. They want to help you and support you. They trust you. And so they don't know from the business. They don't know from, you know, SaaS platforms or what the market share is. All they know is that you are doing this business. They trust you. They know they've calibrated you far enough to know that you can, you know, do it or you'll die trying. And they will give you money to, for a share of your business to help you get forward. 
But what happens if you are not the traditional dead white male founder with all these nice white you know, uh, relatives and their white shirts over there um, and you need cash and your family doesn't have the cash? Well, the word these days for this, what is traditionally a friends and family round is a hustle round. And a hustle round is sort of synonymous with a friends and family round and basically is a non-professional investment round. So before you're ready to pitch VCs or angels or private equity or anybody else out there, you just got to get cash in. So the, the gap between your personal cash and professional investors, that's what the hustle round is. And a hustle round says you will get in any way you can that is legal. You will beg, you will borrow, you will trade, you will sell your soul, you will do whatever you have to do um, to get that cash in there um, from people who are investing because you can sweet talk them, because they've come to like you, um, because uh, they love the, what you're doing, because they know the industry, and they, because they want to be part of a startup for whatever crazy reason. You just get that cash in there some way, somehow. After that, however you've gotten yourself going, you've got the first cash in, you've got the company started, you've got the beginnings, the glimmer of a something, of sales, of a product, of whatever it is. Now you begin to go to the professional investor class. And the first level of professional investor class, our class are people like me. We are known as angel investors. And so angel investors um, go and put in cash in very early stage businesses, taking a lot of risk because the business has barely gotten started yet uh, in exchange for typically a pretty big piece of the company. And hopefully they can be helpful in moving the company forward. We'll talk a little bit more about angels and what they look for down the road. After you get your angel round, and this is also known as an angel round or a pre-seed round, um, you're then ready to go for more funding. And this is from people who are professional investors who are um, known as venture capitalists. And so VCs are people who are investing bigger amounts of money, and that's their job to do this. Um, so often, if you're a first-time founder and you've heard about these mythical VCs and angels or angels and VCs, and you wonder, you know, where do I find them? Who are they? First, understand the difference, and there's a very big difference, and it comes down to one thing out of which everything else flows, and that is VCs, venture capitalists, are professional money managers. That's their job. They get paid a salary to do this. They go out and raise a large pool of money from institutional investors, people, institutions, and organizations that have a lot of money on their, on their books. Things like pension funds, right? What do you think all those, the, the pension funds before they pay it out, you've got to have it. Insurance companies, you pay premiums, they're sitting on lots of cash until they pay out their premium. They got to earn money on those things. And so they invested in safe things, but then they turn around and put a little bit into risky things. And that's venture capital. So venture capitalists raise a big pool of money um, for which they then get paid to go ahead and invest in really interesting, potentially high growth startup companies. In contrast, angel investors are individual people. Um, like me, like people you saw on those slides, they are often um, entrepreneurs themselves. The average angel investor has been an entrepreneur for something like 15 years uh, and has started um, you know, three different companies. Um, so they've hopefully cashed out at some point. So they have a little bit of cash and they wanna stay in the game and they wanna help other entrepreneurs and they wanna pay it forward. <clears throat> so angel investors are individuals. Because these are the two big differences, VCs are investing a big pool of other people's money. They have more money to invest, which means that they can invest bigger amounts in your company. So VC investments are typically in the millions or tens of millions of dollars. Angels are investing out of their own pockets. And so most pockets do not have tens of millions of dollars to invest in startups. So angels investors are investing typically in thousands, tens of thousands of dollars, typically not too much more than that. So Taking all those and putting them together, um, here's what it all looks like, right? If, and this is the scale from left to right on the x-axis. We have the life cycle of a company in sort of a straight line. The y-axis is actually a logarithmic scale. This is an exponential scale. So each of those is 10 times the previous number. If you did this on a linear scale with a straight line, you'd be up past the roof over here, right? So the first money, the earliest stages of the company, when you have an idea and you just need a few thousand dollars to get started, where's that coming from? That's coming from you. You are the first investor. If you And if you can't put anything at all into your company, go home. Because whatever it is, if you are on this call, it means you can pay for internet connections and you can pay for a computer. Um, so you will have something to get your company started. 10 bucks, 1,000 bucks, whatever. You have to put your own cash in first. After that comes the hustle round. 
whether it's the hustle around for people you don't know or friends and family, um, accelerators can fit into this as well. Accelerators started about oh, 15 years ago or so. Um, and these are groups that, that typically the first cash when you join a top tier accelerator, they will give you cash. They'll call it a stipend. And that's not designed to fund the business. That's designed to fund you. So you don't have to go out and rob a bank while you're in the three months of the program. And so typically the original amount for uh, these stipends was um, about $5,000 per month per founder. So the goal is just to keep the wolf in the door while you're in the accelerator program. So it's just a teeny little bit of cash up front. After you've got something going in your thing, in your business, um, then you can begin to go and reach out to professional investors. And that's where the angels come into play. So the next round, um, angel investors, there are probably something between oh, 250 and 500,000 people in America who have done at least any, one angel investment in the last few years. So these are individual people who are investing in somebody they don't know in your business. And so angels will typically invest you know, in the tens of thousands of dollars. On the coast, west coast, east coast, the typical angel investment per company, per angel is about $25,000, sometimes 50, couldn't be as high as 100. Um, in the Midwest and other places outside the coast, it's more like five or $10,000 per angel per company. Um, and so uh, it can go a little bit higher, but they're investing early stage and they're taking and making a bet on you because they believe in what you're pitching them over there. Once you get a little more down the road, you then go to the next level. And the next level are angel groups. So groups of angel investors are a bunch of them coming together to pool their resources, pooling their diligence, pooling their funds, pooling their expertise. And so an angel group can write a check. If you have 10 angels in a group and each person is writing a $25,000 check into your company, that's a quarter million dollars you can get from that angel group. And that's about the same level that seed funds, venture capital funds that specialize in the earliest stages of a company uh, are, are investing investing at. And for people who've been through an accelerator, after you get that accelerator, you know, the 15,000 or 50,000 bucks for the initial stipend while you're in the accelerator, if you then graduate the accelerator, you go to their demo day and outside investors come in for that first round, uh, accelerator programs themselves often have a sidecar fund or a follow-on fund that they're working with, which will then make an investment in your company as well. And so that level, the seed fund, angel group, accelerator, follow-on fund is typically in the you know hundreds of thousands to very 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 low millions right so maybe 250 i would i used to say 250 to 750 but we've had a little inflation over the years so i would say it's now probably you know 250 to uh, um you know a million and a half or so for, for that level round um and the nomenclature has changed over time too uh this would now be known as a pre-seed round an angel round um, you know, when I mean, you get up to this level, it's maybe a seed round, although these days seed round typically implies a venture capital firm. Venture capital firm, there are ones who do early stage deals, ones who do later stage deals, but a typical venture capital um, firm is coming in and, and putting in uh, in the low millions of dollars um, in, into your company. And so they in later stage venture funds will invest tens of millions or maybe even a hundred million or so. Um, but uh, the goal there is to get you to where you're a really big, successful company. And when you hit some number that is a unicorny kind of number, when you're clearly a successful company, people are beating on your door to get in. That is, when, is maybe when you can go to the last stage of trading dollars for equity in the company. And that is an IPO, an initial public offering, when you go in and uh, actually raise money from the public by going onto the public stock markets where people, anybody can go and buy shares in your company. All right. So at hey, any David, stage- Can I interrupt yeah. you real quick? Sure. Because uh, there's a little bit of confusion. Um... Okay. So the hustle round in accelerators, there's two kinds of hustles out there because some people started asking, like, don't you still need to file a securities exemption, you know, if you do a hustle round? And it's like, all right, so your earliest stages, friends and family, and I know this happens often rewriting history. If you're taking money from anywhere, what happens when things get legit? Right. And the, the answer is there is no special exemption for a hustle round. There is no special exemption for taking money from your Aunt Tilly. Right. Um, the only exception is you putting in your own money. If you raise money from anybody else, if you put in, if you take you know, uh, cash in and give them equity out, that is a security. Owning a share of your company is security, and you have to follow the rules. And the rules essentially say that you can raise money from anybody at all 
if you file all the paperwork with the SEC, and that's what going public is doing. When, in the public, when, you, when a company has an IPO, anybody at all can buy one share of stock or a million shares of stock. Um, that's not a problem. But that's very complicated and very expensive and takes a whole lot of things there. So the challenge is what happens if you're only raising a little bit from this hustle around of friends and family and you're not going public? And that's why the whole world of equity crowdfunding was, was and the regulations were put in place. So with an equity crowdfund on things like Republic or, or WeFunder or uh, um, Start, Start Engine and the like, um, Seed Invest, those platforms were designed explicitly for that purpose. So you can raise money from your friends and family. You know, big investors don't go around, angel investors and VCs don't go onto these crowdfunding sites looking for companies to invest in. However, you can raise money on those sites from your friends and family, from the hustle round, totally legally, and they do the paperwork and everything else for it. Or alternatively, um, if the people you're raising money for from are accredited investors, and the, we can get to a whole other thing on, on uh, accredited investors, but basically the rules say that if the only people you're raising money from are worth at least a million dollars, not including their cost, the value of their home, or have an average annual income of at least $200,000 a year, 300,000 if they file jointly with a spouse, then they are what are known as accredited investors and there are no rules. They can invest, have, you can take money from them, sell whatever equity you want, they can invest in whatever valuation, whatever amount they want. It's a very bright line, accredited investors, a million, a million in assets or 200, 300,000 a year in income. Um, but realistically, if you think about it, if you're taking friends and family money and raising a big lot of money, raising $150,000, $100,000, you're not going to take that from somebody who's only worth $100,000, or you shouldn't if you're a legitimate person, right? Um, and so there is no exemption. Hustle rounds have to follow the same rules as everybody else uh, in doing that. All right. And that's the question, Ryan. Yeah. <clears throat> and I will preempt the question that always happens is like, uh, no document is going to stop you from taking money from your Aunt Tilly. So you can go and sign a safe and take five grand from Aunt Tilly and nobody's paying attention to you. But usually what happens if you've didn't, done the things inappropriately is one, they probably decrease the chance of getting attention from professional investors when you're actually going out to it because if your cap table's a mess and you gave it away to half your family and like the valuations are weird and whatnot, they might think you're a naive entrepreneur anyway. But usually those things don't turn into actual equity ownership and you have to have uncomfortable conversations around the dinner table when it's like, oh, hey, Aunt Tilly, you gave me that money to get started, but you're not accredited. So my lawyer is saying we're going to change it into something else or anything like that. It's usually best to be avoided. Yep. So, I mean, there are rules. There are rules for a purpose. And, you know, my book can help. Gus can help um, ask questions. There are lots of information, lots of information out there. But the answer is there are no shortcuts. And I know you think you found a shortcut. Oh, well, I'll get 25 people together and we'll become a no. Whatever shortcut you think you can do, everybody else has tried, doesn't work, is illegal. Um, the only legal way to do this is either to raise money from friends and from uh, a, um, accredited investors, friends and family who are accredited investors, in which case it's perfectly fine. And you can use safes and you can use convertible notes and other things we'll talk about, or do it through one of these crowdfunding platforms, right? So if you do it through a crowdfunding platform, anybody at all, regardless of investor status, can invest $2,500 a year year into startups and more if they have more of an income or, or, or assets. So if you really want to do it that way and they're not accredited investors, go through one of those platforms. Otherwise, do it the right way for accredited investors. Okay. <clears throat> At any stage, when you're raising money, an angel round, a VC round, uh, a hustle round from people who know what they're doing over there, um, you are looking for one thing that is even more elusive than a unicorn. And that is the elusive lead investor. That's the one person who's going to be the first pickle out of the jar so you can get the rest of the cash in there. And this lead investor is somebody, you know, the the, the ideal super, what we call a, a super angel investor. <clears throat> um, and these are all the various characteristics that you would love to have. In reality, there is virtually nobody who fills all of these um, descriptors, but you want to try because life will be a lot easier um, and this is the right way to do it, right? So smart money is somebody who is, you know, you're not pulling the wool over their eyes. They know exactly what they're getting into. They'll probably be a tough negotiator on things like valuation and they'll ask you tough questions, but they're smart. They've done this before and they can really provide advice and you want people in there like that. You want people who are straight. Being smart and clean and honest and high integrity, you know, it sounds like it's easy. Oh, somebody is in a dark alley, wants to give you some, you know, quick cash and, you know, forget the vigorous and so on. 
it doesn't work that way. What if there's one thing I've learned in starting multiple companies over many years, um, you want to deal with people who are straight up and, and good people. Um, life is just too short to take bad money. And I would rather start a company down that have to take money from sleazy people over there, right? You want somebody, your lead investor is committed to the company. They're putting their cash in and they're really committed. It's not just a, a play money they're putting in. They're committed to helping you get other people coming in the company and to be there when, when, when things go south. Um, if you're looking for a lead investor, they've got to write a pretty big check. So whatever the round you're trying to raise is, that lead investor has to be typically putting in as much as the other largest investors in the round. So it's very hard for somebody to, to put $1,000 in and lead around. We are trying to get $20,000 from other people in there. That's not really a lead. There are a few exceptions to that. If the person is really well known and is really working and has a great reputation and is known for writing small checks, but typically you want somebody who's putting in a big chunk of, of cash. You want them to have more cash. So when you need more cash down the road, they can do a follow-on investment. Um, you want them to be able to reach out to other people in their network to help get funding, additional funding into the company. Um, and you want to like them, right? Because again, life is too short. If you have an investor who you really don't like and they don't like you and you're always at loggerheads, this can be really, really gnarly. And I'm going through some of those situations right now and it's not fun. So try and find people you like. And if you can find one of these people don't tell anybody else about it. But that's a, that is gold. This is this is gold. And that person, if you deliver, if you do a decent job or, or try hard on your thing, you may find that person as a mentor and as a, somebody who will be with you for much of your life and, and as you do other companies down the road as a serial entrepreneur. Okay. Putting that aside, when you're pitching investors, whether it's the lead or whether it's follow-ons after the lead or whether it's VCs or angels, um, what are they looking for? And the logical thing is say, hey, they're looking for a really cool idea, the next big thing, right? What's the next great idea? Well, the answer is surprise, surprise, no. Angels and VCs are not looking for ideas. It doesn't matter how good the idea is. You say, why is that? I thought that's what they invest in. No, angels and VCs do not invest in ideas because to them, as elucidated in a wonderful blog post by Derek Sivers, um, to them, ideas are simply a multiplier. A multiplier of what? A multiplier of execution. And that is, what are you doing with the money? How well can you execute? There were plenty of search engines before Google. There were plenty of PCs before Apple. There were car dispatch services before Uber. There were bookstores and online stores before Amazon. In each of those cases, the differentiator was they executed remarkably. And so it helps if you're executing on a really great idea, but execution is more important than an idea. And so if you have a brilliant you know, uh, idea, that's a 20 multiplier, but you know, only so-so execution, that's 20 times 10,000, you know, that's 200,000. On the other hand, if you have you know, your standard you know, good idea, but you have brilliant execution, that's a $100 million play. So therefore, angels don't look for ideas, they look for execution. Next, what angels look for is a scalable business. That's the subtitle of my book, the, the um, Startup Checklist, 25 Steps to a Scalable High Growth Business. A scalable, high growth, a scalable business means, what does it mean? Well, scalability means you can start and get bigger, right? And so therefore, angels want to know that if they put in a little bit of money into your company, you can prove out your thesis. You can prove that there's a product market fit, that people want to buy what you're doing, that you can make money on this small investment, and then you can grow it. Because if you put in a dollar and make 10, scalability says, oh, if I put in a million dollars, I can make 10 million. That's the first piece. And the second piece to scalability is that as the business gets bigger, it gets better. If I were to ask you right now to create a website to sell my book, the cost for you to create that website from scratch, even if you're a coder and everything else, you've got to get the hosting, you've got to get the code, you've got to set it up, and you've got to ship it and everything else, it would be prohibited. It would be more than the cost of my book. If I ask Jeff Bezos to sell a copy of my book, his marginal cost for selling my book is effectively zero because he has the whole thing there. So the bigger something gets, the better the economics get, and I can start it with a small amount of money and get big. So scalability is really important. Next, what investors look for is, remember, it's not ideas, it's, it's execution, and execution comes down to who's doing the execution, and that's you. So we look for the entrepreneur, the founder, and every investor will tell you they would rather invest in a great founder with an okay idea than a great idea with an okay founder. 
And so the, the, we've, we've done actually a whole bunch of uh, uh, sessions here on what people look for in a pitch. Um, I've got a, a TED talk that I did a number of years ago that's a bit of a classic uh, called How to Pitch a VC. And that goes through in detail what we look for. But essentially, I'll just give you like the high points over here. Integrity. If your investors can't trust you, absolutely, they will not invest because there are too many things that can go wrong and they have to trust that they know things will go wrong anyway. But if they can't trust that you're at least trying to do the right thing, they won't invest. You got to have passion for your business because this requires every drop of lifeblood you've got to be an entrepreneur. Investors look for experience, either startup experience, which is great, or something that's analogous to that that you've done in some other area, led a team, something in college, uh, you're starting something in your church. Have you done something that shows you can galvanize people and get something from beginning to end? They look for knowledge, which is domain expertise. Do you understand the business you're in? Do you have the skills um, of product development, of marketing, of sales, of finance, of all those other kinds of things? And if you don't, are you a good enough leader to be able to pull together a team that has those skills in it? And the things that you do to get that team to join you and the investors to join you is to show your commitment. They don't want anybody walking away and running the minute they put their cash in. You've got to be committed for the long haul for this company. And that means you have to have a vision and know that how you're going to change the world but be realistic about it and know who your first customer is before you get to changing the entire world there. And finally, investors, real investors, want somebody who will actually listen. They're not trying, we're not trying to run your business. That's why we're investing in you. But we've had a lot of experience investing in our own companies, investing in other people's companies. And if we give you some advice, we want you to not necessarily take it, but really honestly listen to it and then do what you think is um, uh, the right thing. Next, what investors look for, is traction. And remember we said that's the execution, traction, and traction is the proof of execution. And so what is traction? You hear that all the time. Oh yeah, I come back when you have a little more traction. And you might say, oh, well, I've got my product almost finished. And hey, can I, when I finish it, is that traction? No. Surprise, surprise, traction is not at all what you think it is. If you ask any founder, what's traction? They'll probably give you a list that looks like this. I got a great idea, or I've hired a wonderful employees. I got patents. I got a business plan. I got a prototype. I've, I've raised money. None of that is traction. None of this counts as traction. And when it comes time for an investor, investors look at all this stuff and say, okay, 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 that's very nice. Nice. I'm glad you have this, but sorry, no. So you ask, what the hell is traction? Traction is something that is outside of your control. Remember, if you go back and think about it, all these things are in your control. You can have a great idea. You can hire employees. You can get investors. You can file for a patent, right? You can code a product, write your business plan. You can buy Google AdWords. You can get you know, all kinds of press about you, right? You can even raise money. None of that is traction. Traction is outside your control, something that demonstrates that you have created value in your company, and that value is of use to somebody else who's willing to pay real money for it, ultimately, and that value is getting bigger and better every day. So therefore, logically, what is the best kind of, of traction? You guessed it, right? Paying customers. Um, but other than that, you know, think pilot customers, beta customers, you know, um, want people who say, this is so amazing. I can't wait for you to do it because then I'm going to, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll have something outside of your control. And that's what we look for in terms of traction. And then the final thing investors look for on top of all that is a reasonable valuation. And this is where the rubber often meets the road as far as investors are concerned and where the disconnect happens with founders. Um, because founders' ideas of reasonable valuation and investors' ideas of reasonable valuation are often quite different. And there is a very logical reason for why that happens, which is I am about to show you, because now don't tell anybody, lock the door. This is the secret economics of the angels, right? This is how we actually look at investing in early stage startups. So let's say, for example, that I'm an angel investor. Let's say that I'm a rich-ish person. I've got maybe $10 million in assets. Really, really rich people like, you know, I must go out and make an angel investments, you know, so I call them rich-ish people. Um, so let's say you have $10 million and you're going to, um, uh, therefore, of that, take no more than 10% of your, of your assets and invest it in these crazy startups. So you'll take a million dollars, you're allocating a million dollars to invest in startups, but you don't put all your eggs in one basket. You diversify your portfolio because it's so risky. So therefore, you're going to take that million dollars and distribute it over 10 deals, right? You're going to put in either 100,000 bucks or 50,000 reserving some more for a follow-on round. Um, so let's say we're putting in um, uh, you know, 10 companies here, right? 
Now, we think about this and we say, what kind of return do we think would be fair and appropriate that I should get? And if I ask you, a founder, what you think would be appropriate, put yourself in my shoes. I can put my money in a bank. I got this million dollars. I can put this money in a bank and today get maybe 2% interest, 1%, 2% interest. I can put it in the stock market uh, and maybe get um, you know 5% over time. Historically, the stock exchange has, has resulted in about a 5% um, value increase annually over time. If I'm an accredited investor, and remember, if I'm making an angel investment, I'm an accredited investor, uh, I can have access to hedge funds, and hedge funds let me um, go uh, invest against things as well as for them. Uh, and so I can often get 10% with a hedge fund. That's what Bernie Madoff was promising he would give people. So you know, how he got a different story, but it's a logical thing. Or I can invest in a private equity fund, which invests not only in public companies like a hedge fund, but in private companies. And those typically target a higher range of say 15%, right? And if I want to take really risky you know, aspect of my money and diversify, I can invest in a venture capital fund. Remember, I can give my money as an individual investor to a VC to invest. And there are people who like Sequoia and first round capital and so on. And they'll invest in these, in these companies and make a lot of money, hopefully. And typically, VC funds target about a 20% net return to their investors, right? So 20%. So just think, if I can make 20% return on my money by giving it to a venture fund and letting them do all the work, uh, then, hmm, what happens? Why should I ever do this crazy investing in startups, taking all the time and effort to find them and all the other kind of stuff? So I should get more than that, fairly, right? Uh, and so therefore, if I were to tell you that angel investors typically look at a 25% return, right? Only 5% higher than the VC thing, 25 to 30% return, would you say that that's fair and reasonable? I would think you would. I mean, I don't see how you couldn't say it's reasonable, but I can get you know close to that from giving my money into a, to a fund or something. So therefore we say, okay, I'm looking for 25% return on my money. Fair enough. So when do I get it back? Well, if I put my money in a bank, I can get it out right away. If I put it in a CD, it's locked up for six months or a year or two years. The problem is if I put money in a startup, it's sort of locked in there. Startups are not liquid. I can't take my money out if I put it in your company because you're using it to build the company, right? And so it turns out that the average holding time for an investment, successful investment as, a, as an angel investor is in the US is between nine and 10 years. That's how long it takes to get my return on my investment. Now, if we had to calculate locking my money up for nine or 10 years and I have to get the kind of return that makes sense, but that money locked up for a decade, nobody would ever be an angel investor. So therefore we say, okay, forget that. I'm going to ignore that. And I'm going to say that, hmm, I'm going to guess I'll get my money back in six years. VCs typically look at about a five-year horizon. I invest before the VCs, so I'll look at a five-year, six-year horizon. Okay, makes it a little bit easier. So let's do the math. How does that actually work? Well, if I am talking about getting a 25% return each year, for six years that your my money is in the company over here, right? Um, that that means the math for this is, if you remember your high school math, 1.25 times 1.25 for the second year, times 1.25 for the third year. So effectively 1.25 to the power of six, which equals 3.8. And the difference between those two numbers is the 25% is the IRR internal rate of return, what I expect to over time between the beginning and end of my investment get from that company. That's the 25%. The 3.8 is the ROI, return on investment. And that is for every dollar I put in, six years later, I have to get $3.80 back. Okay, so far so good. So now here's what angels say. They say, great, we all agree on that. It makes perfect sense. We all agree that's fair. But here's how the math works for the angel investors. And the angel investors math is based on reality. And reality is what happens to those 10 investments that I made? Well, based on all kinds of surveys over all kinds of years done on an annual basis, it turns out on average of those 10 investments, no matter how great you are, five of them will fail completely. I mean, literally go bankrupt, lose all of my money. That's not a very good return. Luckily, I have five companies that haven't failed. Well, of those five companies that haven't failed, two of them roughly will return back the original investment that I put in uh, because there will be the company won't succeed, but there'll be an aqua hire or you'll sell the patents or you'll sell your remaining inventory or whatever it is, and I'll get back the cash I put in. Well, that's seven out of the 10. 
Luckily, I got three companies left that are both going to be better than that, right? Well, I do. And two of them are going to be what we call doubles or triples. Those, those are going to be returning two or three times my investment. And, you know, if I could get that all day long, I would take that. That'd be really great. Unfortunately, it's only two out of my, my portfolio, right? Before you yeah. reveal the final one, because we've sure. been having fun with Zoom, I'm going to run a poll because we have one company left. And I want to see what people think, how much it will need to return Ooh, uh, before okay. you launch into this. Okay. So I think I just, I don't know if you'll be able to yeah. see it, David. Yeah, I'm, yep, I see it. Okay, let's see. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, interesting here. Okay, let's see. We have a 5X, a 10. It seems to be 10 is the predominant here. 30, 60, 100. Okay, more fives coming in. <laughs> oh, hey, oh, I love this. This is a great idea, Ryan. Okay, go ahead. Come on, folks. Answer this. 95, 97. We get, come on. To a 2X. Okay. We've already got 100, 105 in. We're almost uh, there. 100X. Okay. Oh, this is fascinating. Okay. Really interesting. Well, so folks, think about this. Let's, let's take it from the beginning, right? So a 2X um, is... Uh, would be double my money, which would be great, but I've already got two companies that are returning my, my two to three X. Um, and so what would happen if that one comes in, my, my last company comes in with that as well? We'll, we'll? we'll see that, right? You know, a 10 X, that sounds like a really great deal, right? 10 times my investment. Whoa, um, that would be a, a good return there, right? A uh, hundred X, well, that, you, know, you better be doing it. If you're, you better be Amazon or Google or something on that one, right? Uh, okay, fine. So now let me thank you, Ryan, for doing that. Um, let's put this away. Uh, and now let's do the great big reveal uh, and see what happens. Well, to do the reveal, we first got to do the math. And the math says, okay, here's, here's my outcomes, right? I got five at a zero return. I got two at a 1x return, my money, two at a 3x return. And so now let's do the multiplication of that out. But each of those only accounts for one tenth of my original portfolio investment, right? Because I invested in 10 companies, the same amount, each of 10 companies. So five times zero is zero times one tenth of that is zero. Two, the, the, uh, the two that return the even money, that's one times my investment, but it's only one tenth of my portfolio. So that's 0.2%. And I got the two, you know, triple beggars, let's say, or three X, so that's three times two, that's six, but one tenth, so that's 0 0.6. But remember, my target for that only getting that 25% IRR that we all agreed was, was, was appropriate, my target was that 3.8 ROI. So if you take the 3.8 ROI and you subtract out what I got here, I got a hole. I got a hole of three times my portfolio. Okay, so that should, that should, in theory, we had a couple people here who were saying uh, that we should get 2x or 5x. We had 10 people who were saying we should get between 2 and 5x, and that, you know, that 3 would be a particularly good, you know, that's right in the middle there, 3 to 5x. The only problem is that I have to get that three times my original investment on my entire portfolio from that one company. And so Jonathan Zola in the chat just nailed it, which means that one company has to return 3.0 times one divided by one tenth or 30 times my investment. And so that's how you see that while not being greedy at all, right? Just trying for a, uh, you know, an investment that returns a little bit more than I could get by investing in a venture capital fund. I need to get 30 times my investment in your company. And the problem here is I don't know which of you on this call is going to be the 30x return. Right. I hope it'll be all of you, but in reality, I know it's only going to be one out of the, uh, you know, one out of you. So one out of ten. So I get to get thirty x on my return. Okay. Uh, so now I, you know, normally this is where we would end the end the, uh, the the session here. Except that there's so much good stuff that Brian, can I keep going here and, and people can drop off if they want to, and we'll we'll take the time because we're going to record this. You can come back and look at it later. All right. Uh, so, all right, great. We know what we're looking for. We know what the economics have to be and how we get there. We know who we're pitching for funding over here. So now how do we actually get the investors, angels or VCs to write you a check in your company? And the way we do that is something called, ta-da, the pitch, right? And so the pitch is where you pitch me, it comes uh, the, the company, all about your company, and I catch it hopefully, and I say, oh, this looks really great. I wanna buy a piece of this company with my hard earned money. And so everybody has to have a pitch. The pitch is the first thing you learn about an accelerator is probably shouldn't be, but it is. Uh, and it's the first thing you ask any entrepreneur about their pitch, it's the one word you know about, about startup funding. But here's the thing, you don't have one pitch, you have five 
pitches. I know I said four in the intro to this thing, but you need five pitches over here. Five different pitches. Why on earth do you need five pitches? Well, let me tell you. The first pitch you need is something called the elevator pitch. The elevator pitch is a short pitch, and the term comes from what if you happen to be stuck in an elevator with me, right? You and I are coming up in, into a building, we're in the elevator, and between my the lobby and my floor, you have just the length of that elevator ride to tell me how wonderful your company is and what you should do. That's the elevator pitch. It doesn't often happen in an elevator, but it will often happen at a cocktail party or, or when you meet somebody out there. Um, this, this is your really short pitch. And in that, and the goal for this pitch, not to have me write a check, the goal for this pitch is to get me to give you a meeting where you can come in and give me your full on pitch, right? And so what do we therefore do in an elevator pitch? It's got to be exciting. You, you have that really short time to excite me to tell you what it is you do. I will never ask for a follow up thing if I don't understand what you do. So it's got to be really sharp and really short. And because I'm looking to make money, you got to tell me how what you do, no matter how sexy it is, makes money. You'd be amazed at how many people tell me I'm doing this amazing, great thing, I'm whatever, and I have no clue as to how they're making money, right? And then the question is, well, why you? What's special about you? Why is it that you are able to make money doing this thing from uh, this business? What's your background relative to it? And the thing is, this is not a big, long thing. There's no PowerPoint. There's no business plan. This is short and sweet. So you got to keep it really, really simple. And short is the operative word here. Your elevator pitch, you should aim for no more than 30 seconds. 30 seconds is not a long period of time. Um, and that means you, you know, take a first draft of your thing and then read it out loud at a, at a regular cadence to see how long it takes. And if it's not 30 seconds, cut it down. And then once you've got to cut down to less than 30 seconds, and frankly, if you could do it in 15 seconds, that's even better, but I'll take 30 seconds, right? Once you do that, you've got to have it down cold, absolutely cold. I should be able to go into your room in the middle of the night and poke you in the belly button, and you should pop up and say, aha, here's my elevator pitch. Um, really, it, you have to be absolutely cold because you never know where you're going to meet an investor. And so therefore, it has to be ready on the tip of your tongue at all times, clean and simple and exciting and ready to go because the goal is to get me to invite you to pitch to New York Angels or come to my business competition or come to my office over there. And so that's the first pitch. The second pitch is on a more organized version. You will find that there are demo days, there are business competitions, pitch competitions, um, there are screening sessions for investor groups and so on. And so this is where you need the quick pitch. And the quick pitch is for you, all these purposes, this is this will be your, your first PowerPoint or keynote presentation, right? It's going to be short and sweet. It's going to be the summary of what you're doing. It's not your entire business plan. Um, it's going to be aiming for five minutes, right? Five minutes. You'll use slides, so it's going to be visual, but you're not going to have tons of text in the slide. It's going to be just images. You're talking, and you have five minutes in front of your audience, looking your audience in the eye to get them a compelling, exciting thing backed up by some visuals. Really punchy here, right? And because this is not a due diligence session, this is not talking to your banker, this is trying to excite and interest your audience in wanting more. This is only the good things. Don't tell me about all the competition that's out there and how they're better than you are. You're trying to take them. Don't tell me about all the risks you're doing. I don't need that right now, right? <laughs> this is just to excite me to invite you to, a next, to the next meeting over here, right? So tell me the good things. And in that five minutes, you got to hit the major points, right? Um, the team, who is your team that is doing it? You and your, and your teammates. What is the market? Is the market big? Is it growing? What is the problem this market has? How are you solving this market? What is your solution? What is your solution and how do you make money with the solution, obviously? What traction have you, do you have that proves that you have a solution to make money here? And then depending on the circumstance, how much you're trying to raise. If it's an official competition uh, or, or a pitch thing, they'll ask you how much you're trying to raise. If it's not, you can just, you know, in, if, in general, if you can avoid saying that, that's great. But if it's a thing where you're trying to raise money, then you have to say it. But otherwise, that's what you do in this five minute pitch. All right, that's two out of the five. The next three are all the same thing. The next three are your venture presentation. This is what is commonly known as the pitch, right? But the interesting thing is the pitch, this venture presentation that you're giving to VCs or angels has to be done in three versions. One version is what you typically think of as the venture pitch. This is what you will come to my office and you will put up on the screen and you will give me your 18 minute, that's a length of a TED talk, by the way, um, speaker pitch. Um, it could be 15 minutes, it could be 20 minutes, but this is, this is typically where I am allocating time. I've 
right to my calendar. I'm sitting with you in a room, or you're you're in there presenting before our, our angel group and our and our monthly meeting, and we are all focused on you and giving you the time to do the pitch. And you've got this 15 to 20 minute pitch. I would tend to suggest airing on the 15 minute side rather than the 20 minute side. But this pitch typically will be done with PowerPoint or Keynote or PDF, um, you know, backup. So you're not narrating a slide presentation. You are telling, you are talking to me. You are conversationally telling me about all this cool thing about your business, um, and you're backing it up with slides that are providing emotional resonance. There are lots of resources about this, including my, my uh, TED Talk, which I strongly suggest you do, including another session that we've done here in, in this series with Gust about how to do a pitch. So look at all those things. There are great books in this stuff as well. Um, and we have all kinds of resources there. But having done that, your main pitch, you now need to do two variants of that pitch. First up is the short version. This is the teaser pitch when somebody says, oh yeah, I might like to uh, have you over next week, but, but send me your deck in advance. Well, you don't send them your speaker deck because your speaker deck is just providing support for you speaking and you're not gonna be there, right? What you wanna do is send them a very short abbreviated version of your deck that has more text in it and more words than your speaker presentation because you're not there. And the goal is not going to be all the too many of the bad things here. This will be probably a five or 10 slide deck. It's a shortened abbreviated version just enough to let them know what you're doing. So they have the context. So they see the key metrics about the numbers and the team and so on and so forth. And then you go in, you give your pitch log, you don't give them something, a handout while you're there because otherwise they'll read that instead of listening to you. But after you finish, whether you're doing a Zoom pitch or whether you're doing a pitch in their office, then you have the third version, which is the detailed pitch. It's the leave behind version. They will have already heard it from you, but they're not, you're not gonna be there when they're reading this. And so this will be the version you did live plus all the things you talked about. It'll have a lot more text. It'll have, have some more graphics. It'll have some more appendices and backup material in there. This could be 15, you know, 20 minutes, uh, you know, 15 or, 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 or 20 slides. Um, but this is the longer version. This is what they will refer to as they go into due diligence on, on what you're doing. So those are the five kind of pitches that, that uh, you do. Um, we developed, I wrote a, a blog post for Gust called the Startup Founders Pitch Toolbox, which we're going to link to in the show notes for this. And we'll, we'll send to you and you can look up on the Gust website, um, which goes through all of the various components that you need for these pitches, not just these five pitches, but everything else that you absolutely should have if you are a founder looking to raise money. And so time is a little short, so I'm just gonna quickly skim through the things here, go back and check the list in, in, in detail, right? So the first things, the first list is things you absolutely have to have. Do not leave home without them. This is the, the, the baseline stuff. Uh, Ryan just put the list into the, uh, the chat, um, so uh, you can download it over there. But essentially, this is your one sentence. Somebody says, what do you do? I do, ha, you know, eBay for dogs or whatever it is, right? I mean, you know, something, one line, punchy, let me know this is your cocktail party thing. Um, a logo, when you're pitching or when, you're, when I go to your website, I wanna see something that can remind me of who your company is, or any visual thing. A physical business card, business cards are not dead. Yes, I've had a, a virtual business card for over 10 years at this point, but in the real world, if you're meeting somebody at a party, you're not gonna sit out there fiddling with phones or often they don't wanna try and do it or they can't scan the QR code or whatever it is. You want a physical business card that has your URL on it, that has your, uh, you, you can put a QR code on your physical card so they can have it with them later, but you wanna have a physical business card. Um, you wanna have a short one paragraph, short paragraph description of your business that you can email um, if somebody says, what do you do? Or is the cover note uh, for your, when you're sending your, your deck to somebody. Um, you have to have a, a personal LinkedIn profile because when I want to know who you're pitching, I'm going to check you and I'm going to see who we know in common. Who can I check for a reference? Where have you been? What's your history? And I can get that on your, your profile. So it's really important. Um, as we discussed, 30 second elevator pitch, absolutely. You got to have it. Um, we talked about the teaser. You got to have it. We talked about your live presentation. You got to have it. Uh, and we talked about um, your uh, leave behind the, um, the, the after presentation deck. Uh, and I would suggest that on top of these, although I put the five minute short and quick pitch in the next section, I probably should put it in this one uh, as well. So these are ones, you, if you don't have these, go up and get them all and do it right now. The next set are stuff that are good to have. And, and most founders have these things because you will need them and better to, to have it in advance so you don't have to do it on the fly when somebody asks for it, right? Um, and these are things including a, a, a website. If you have a company without a website, nobody believes you have a company, <laughs> right? I don't care whether you're in stealth mode, I don't care, whatever it is. These days, website is synonymous with, with, with company out there, right? 
a digital business card realistically that makes life a lot easier over here, right? Um, and so um, you, you would scan it with a QR code or, or link, you can generate it from LinkedIn. People can do your, your card that way. Um, helpful to have a digital card. Your a profile for your business on LinkedIn so I can see who else works in the company and information about that. Um, I would have said a personal Twitter handle, although these days, not so sure about that. Um, uh, and, and by the way, Sandy asked, what's a digital business card? It's a, effectively a, a website devoted to information that would be on a business card. It will automatically let me add you to my contacts. Um, it will let me link to your company and so on and so forth. You can Google it and find it. And there are resources that we, we can link you to here, right? Twitter handle is a way you can get the word out, but also these days, Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn and other kinds of things as well. Um, a headshot. You know, don't just use a vacation photo of yourself. Get a professional headshot done every time you are introduced by anybody for your various social media profiles. You want to look professional. You want a professional headshot over there, right? Bios of yourself for when you get introduced um, or when you're being listed in a program. Um, and don't do it on the on the on the spot. Have it done in advance so you can really take maximum use of the fifty or hundred or five hundred words uh, that you're that you're getting to. Um, for scheduling things, Calendly is really great. You want to be able to control your online Zoom meetings and stuff. Um, so a, a customized background, like you see over here with our with our our, our Gus background, um, you can have one that. that enforces your brand uh, and looks very professional there. Um, you know, Instagram account, um, a one pager uh, tells the whole story of your company in one page is typically what angels use at their meetings and the like. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't say fill out your Gus profile. Gus profile solves a lot of these problems. It serves as, as a, a quick intro to the company and your summary and your one pager um, and everything else. So, and, it, and it's free. So uh, no reason not to do that. And then if you want to go really crazy and be a real super pro and be really impressive to your various VCs, there are all kinds of things that serious founders have um, in addition to that, right? Uh, a demo video, an explainer video, a video pitch, a, a multi-page executive summary, um, you know, a demo account, a, uh, a, a, a lean business plan, a cap table. We discussed about that and uh, the things that Dunn's profile, you need that for to be an Apple uh, a vendor, um, you, know, uh, you know, video conference a way to track your sales funnel, um, a whole data room that you can give serious investors access to day one. So this is stuff that, that real professional founders have and that investors often expect that you will have much of this stuff. Again, we have a link to the uh, this in the, in the chat as well as uh, in the show notes over here. So don't spend time writing this down, but just think about it. These are the kinds of things we have. All right. So let me finish up here, and then we'll take questions with the reason you came to this webinar in the first place, which is, oh, and then fundraising, how do I raise funds? What do I get them in, right? Um, so there are differing ways when somebody is giving you money, and that money is going into the company to help the company grow, there are a whole lot of different forms that you can get, right? If I said, you're raising money, here's money, and you say, great, huh, give, me, give me the money. Okay, but now what do I get back for that, right? Why am I giving you the money? And so here, I'll quickly run through it. Again, there's tons of information about this and back up in my books, in, in the Gus Lee blog, on Gus's website, um, and we can answer some more questions about it later. Okay, first up, we discussed the grant, right? A grant is free money. A grant literally is somebody giving you free money. If you're the small independent business, you can get local grants for economic development or, or a, a small business grants to help hire people and to get your business started in there. If you're a high growth startup, you can try and go yourself an SBIR grant for a high growth um, thing that's breaking new ground, technologically speaking, and so on, that's free money. That's the beginning and end of free money. Next way to get money, you go to a bank and you get money from the banker in a loan. A loan is money that you get, but that has a time limit on it. There's a clock running and that money has to come back. So at the end of one year or one month, or whatever the term of the loan is, you've got to pay that money back with interest to the bank. Um, and so that doesn't always work because nobody wants to take, remember, since the, the person who's lending you the money only gets back the original money plus the interest of, you know, five or two or 10% interest over there, that's no compensation for risk and your business is very risky. So therefore, huh, if you can't get a loan from them, now you get to selling stock and this is where the equity comes into play, right? And so common stock is an ownership share in your company. If we have a hundred shares in the company and you buy one share, you own one tenth of the company and you you get the good and you get the bad. And when the company sells for a billion dollars, if you have 10%, you get $100 million, which is really great. Um, the problem with this for investors is that what if the company doesn't, if a company, I invest $1 million and I get 
10% of your company, right? So now uh, the company for $10 million and I have $1 million ownership, one tenth ownership of that. The company sells for now $100 million. I get $10 million back from that, my one tenth. I get 10X my original investment and I'm very happy. No problem. What happens, however, if the company sells for $10 million? the amount of money that I that we valued it when I invested. Well, the company tells me $10 million, I'll get my one-tenth of it back. That's the million dollars I put in. I don't make any money. I don't lose any money. I'm not a particularly happy camper, but okay, the company wasn't a success. It, didn't, it wasn't worth any more at exit than it was worth when I invested. Um, so, okay, not great, but I can maybe live with that, but investors won't live with that because it's too risky. Because what happens in the bad case? What happens if the company only sells for a million dollars? Instead of, remember, I invested at a valuation of 10 million post. And if I now the company sells at the end of the game for a million dollars, well, I get my 10%, but 10% of a million dollars is $100,000. So I only got $100,000 back. But you, you founder, you founder who lost <laughs> my money, who made this company go from 10 million to a million, you get $900,000 back. So you've made $900,000 and I get my, I lost $900,000. That doesn't work for me. And so that's why investors do not invest in common stock. Instead, what investors will, might invest in is something called preferred stock. Now, preferred stock is a different kind of stock. Um, it says, I get you know, um, a, a part ownership of the company, um, but it's a special kind of stock because when the time comes, if the company sells for less than the, whatever the company sells for, more or less the same amount of the valuation, the very first money that comes out from that sale goes to me until all of my preferred investment is paid back. So in that case, if the company sells for 100 million, I get my 10 million back. If the company sells for 10 million, I get my million dollars back, right? If the company sells for a million dollars, right? It was a disaster, it was only worth a tenth there. I still get my million dollars back because my money comes out first. Well, that's good in the downside. So preferred stock lets me cover my downside if a company sold for a little bit, but because it only, it gets my money back first, but it only gets my money back. So what happens if it sells for $100 million? I only get my million dollars back. Well, that's not very good. <laughs> I want I'm, I'm taking a risk to invest in you for the upside. So therefore, what venture capital firms, all venture capital firms and all serious angel investors invest in is something called convertible preferred stock. And this is a magic stock over there. This is a stock that says, okay, it starts out as preferred stock. So if at the end of the day, the company isn't a success and the company um, you know, sells for less than the valuation we assigned it to, um, I get my million dollars back because it's preferred stock. But if the company is a success and it's now worth $100 million, I can wave my little magic wand and go presto changeo and turn my preferred stock into common stock. And therefore, I get my 10% share of the whole company over here. And so that's what all VCs invest in. It's called convertible preferred stock. Um, now, the problem is doing a convertible preferred stock, it's called a full equity round, a full priced equity round. It's how much I'm buying. And uh, it's got all kinds of, it, it can be 100 pages of documentation or at least 50 pages of documentation. It can cost you know a fair amount of money to paper. Um, even if you use online platforms and stuff, it's still thousands of dollars on lawyers to paper. And for a very small investment, a, a C stage, angel, friends and family investment, it's typically not appropriate to spend the money on doing a full on round. And there are also other problems with pricing it and the like. And so therefore, uh, what many angel investors invest in is something called a convertible note. So a convertible note is a loan. I'm loaning you the money, but it's convertible into equity. And that's all of our intention. The intention of both the investors and the, the company is that my, uh, my money will eventually convert into ownership of the company into equity, but it starts out as debt. It starts out as a loan with a maturity and they'll say it'd be an 18 month loan. And if at the end of that 18 months, you haven't done another round, you know, I can get my money back. Um, but if you, if you have done another round with some sophisticated, smart investors, um, then whatever terms they get, I'll convert my note and buy shares the same amount of money they're doing with some kind of a discount typically because I came in first. Um, and so that's what a convertible note is. But 
that's great for investors, all right? It's debt, so that means it comes out before any kind of equity um, if something goes really wrong. Uh, it's uh, convertible into stock if there's a good thought, good side and things happen. I now get a piece of the upside over there. Um, the problem, however, for the company's perspective is that it's a loan and the loans have maturity dates and they come out before anything else. And, uh, and therefore the maturity date uh, is typically 12 months, 18 months on this thing. And if the end, if you get to 18 months and the company can't raise any more money as it, as it was hoping to do, um, then what happens? Well, the company can't pay it back, but the loan is due. So that puts a whole lot of power into the hands of the investors who can say, I demand my money back. And if you don't do it, I'll force the company into bankruptcy which they won't do, but what they can often do is use that leverage to help restructure the company or loan you more money or do something else. And that's the way most investors would want to structure it because it gives them some safety in this scenario. However, companies don't like that. And so some companies that had some power in this operation, those coming out of the Y Combinator uh, Accelerator program were very full of themselves and Y Combinator worked with them to create another kind of new investing document called a SAFE. A safe note is a simple agreement for future equity. And you can think of this as sort of like a convertible note, except that it's not a note, which means it's not a loan, which means it doesn't have to be paid back and it doesn't have priority over everybody else uh, and it doesn't have a due date. So it just says that sort of like a convertible note, if and when you do a, a financing round, um, then it'll convert into equity like a convertible note would. But if it doesn't, then it's not a sort of, sort of Damocles hanging over your head and you don't have to do that. So these are the different forms of startup investments, um, the way you will get money into your company and what you give the investor in exchange. And so let me leave you before we get into the Q&A over here with some more resources. Ryan will give you all the resources and all kinds of links, but there are books, people have been writing books for a long period of time uh, about how to start up a company, right? And remember we said there are two kinds of companies, back to the point, place, the beginning. Um, you have the small independent business and you have the high growth startup. For the small independent business, there are some really good books out there. You know, uh, Inc. Magazine, Entrepreneur Magazine. You know, Startup for uh, you know for Dummies, um, Finance and Business, uh, The Idiot's Guide. Um, these are all really good books about how to set up the small business over there. Um, in my experience, the best that I've that I've found um, is a really interesting book called Small Time Operator um, by Bernard Kamaroff, and it, it's 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 done with sort of tongue in cheek, but it's really good, really solid about doing all the things you need to do to set up this typical small independent business. If on the other hand, you are the high growth track and you're trying to be, you know, go big or go home, go be Amazon or go bankrupt over there. There are a whole bunch of things. You probably have heard some of these titles before. These are all linked to in the reading list that I've uh, linked to uh, online. Um, the Lean Startup by Eric Reese about Lean Startup methodology. The Startup Owner's Manual by Steve Blank. Um, what well, classic in this thing, Zero to Peter Thiel, Steer at Zero to One. The original one in this thing, Art of the Start by Guy Kawasaki. Um, uh, the best book in this area, he says totally modestly with no interest whatsoever, uh, is this wonderful book by this guy, David S. Rose, called The Startup Checklist, 25 Steps to a Scalable High Growth Business, um, which will walk you through everything we've, we've told you today and a whole lot more, all about how to do business plans and build a team and hire fine professionals and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so that's a great book there. Uh, resources, um, I, I've done a resource page myself for things that I've talked about here in this, in this session uh, and online. Um, and so it's at davidsrose.zealous.space. It's a single one page linked to a lot of resources, including my TED talk and the books and the reading list and stuff like that. And then Ryan would fire me if I didn't give you as the last resource. There's a wonderful company called Gust. Um, and so Gust.com, um, if you're looking for financing, if you're looking to start your business, Gust really, we've done everything you know, to make it easy for you. And given our experience in this space, my personal experience, Gust has been around for nearly 20 years at this point. We have worked with literally millions of startups. Uh, and so whether it's incorporating your company, starting your company, managing your cap table, you know, finding investors, planning your raise, closing your investment, the documentation for all this kind of stuff we talked about. Um, that's what we're all about. And so with that, I will finally take a breath and we can field questions, Ryan. Ah, wonderful. Obviously, you're like a Twitch streamer over here right now. Uh, people, thank you very much for your time. And I know uh, we went longer than we planned to. So thank you for, I mean, so many people are still around. So we're going to get to this Q&A. These questions are great. I'm sorry if uh, somebody asked a question we weren't able to get to, but uh, let's get going. Uh, all right, all the way back <laughs> to 3.28 p.m. Um, all right. So somebody asked an anonymous attendee asked why VCs are telling founders to pitch them with an idea on their website. Um, 
founders who got VC funded said they'd raise a million dollars before even getting into accelerator programs. What is the what is the true story of that? Yeah, the, so the, the, the true story is, is I, I like to say, you know, nobody funds ideas, nobody funds this kind of stuff, right? And and so, you know, there are no such things as absolutes in life, right? There are literally no absolutes. There are 8 billion people in the world or whatever it is. Um, and you can find an example of everything. You can find, you know, a, a six-fingered uh, swordsman. You can find um, a, you know, uh, whatever. Um, and you can, and, and can, you, can you point to somebody who invested on just an idea? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Does that happen in the real world? No, it doesn't. Doesn't have. Will it happen to you? No, it will not. Right. And the answer is, you know, when, when I make these declarative statements about, you know, investors need to get thirty x, nobody funds ideas, so on and so forth. You know, I, I am I am deliberately slightly overstating because it is like a ninety nine percent one. Is there a one percent chance that you will do that? Maybe. But the bottom line is because it is highly unlikely that you will be that one weird combination of circumstances where somebody will, will do that. If you think that that is a real live possibility, you will spend all your focus trying to reach for that star that will never exist. And instead of, of, of doing what you should be doing, which is hustling and starting the company, right? And so and so therefore, I'm making it as a clarity statement, but I am a grown up and I understand these <laughs> things happen. And realistically, VCs who say pitch us ideas, they are working on a thing of scale, right? Remember, you know, a, 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 I told you the odds for getting an SBIR grant if you qualify for the kind of company that can get a government grant are one in four. The odds of getting an angel investment, angel investors look at 40, four zero companies before they find one to invest in. Um, and so that means it's 10 times tougher to get angel investments than it is to get an SBIR grant, right? VCs look at 400 companies before they find one to invest in. That's for regular VC funding with an existing traction in a business, right? So your chances are, are 0.25%. So now you say, oh, well, somebody wants to give me money just for an idea. What are the odds of that? Okay, let's say that's you know another 10x, one in 4,000. So great, one in 4,000 companies will actually get funded for an idea but 3,999 will not. And you can spend your time trying to get that, or you can do it and you know, improve your odds by 10X by having traction. And I think that marries with something we preach at Gust in general is when you think about a space so full of uncertainty as startups, well, and we run into this all the time. I swear to God, I get the question of like, how do I use my... Uh, 401k to invest to buy my founder shares because I read a Forbes article that Peter Thiel did that in this one company and like had tax-free gains. It's like, those are not the things to focus on. The things you're doing is trying to increase your chances of success and reduce your risks. And the more you can actually play that book, the more likely you are, you know, putting all your eggs into one basket to say like, oh, I'm going to go and like get a million dollars for an idea. You increase your chance of failure I don't know, ridiculous amounts. So it's really about kind of like avoiding the risk of ruin and giving yourself the best chances. So, so for example, people often ask, you know, you know, can I be, you know, Elon, can I start a company like Elon Musk, right? You know, can three companies like Elon Musk? Well, okay, clearly Elon Musk exists. He lives and breathes and he clearly started, you know, or effectively started or was the first investor in SpaceX, Tesla and PayPal, right? So clearly it can be done subjunctive because somebody did it, right? Can you do it? Well, there's no law that says you can't do it. There are ultimately, with, with some tweaks and exceptions, it doesn't matter race, color, creed, national origin, disability, whatever it is, right? It is doable. The question is, can you do it? Well, sight unseen, the odds are tremendously against you in doing it, right? And so therefore, you can say, sure, anybody can be president. Um, anybody can, can be Elon Musk. There's nothing stopping you from doing it, except that the odds of it being you, as opposed to the person next to you, or being Elon Musk, are so vanishingly tiny that if you say, my goal is to be Elon Musk or bust, you are going to have a very challenging life, and you will always be failing what you're setting out to do, right? If instead you're trying to say, I am trying to create real value for a company, and, and wherever that takes me, doing the best job I can whether that company is a successful lifestyle business, small independent business that is creating money for me and my family, whether I can get a partner, whether I can sell it to somebody, whether I can get venture backed and whatever it is, you know, that's the goal. So the answer is, again, speaking in absolutes, sure, somebody can run, you know, uh, Steve Jobs can run Apple and Pixar and, and uh, Elon Musk can run PayPal, SpaceX and, and uh, Tesla. But the bottom line is that's not going to happen for anybody I know, any rational person, and you shouldn't focus on that. 
Excellent. All right. Next up, uh, we've got Kyle asking, uh, investing your own money. Uh, so this is back in the middle of it. Would a founder's contribution include the value of their own time invested in the company? Assuming <laughs> they're not paying themselves. <laughs> All right. You would think it should. It would be fair, right? You would think it would be logical. No, unfortunately, it doesn't, right? Sweat equity is expected. That's par for the course. Table stakes. Everybody, you know, when you come and start a company, the expectation is you are putting in your sweat equity. Because remember, when investors invest for your company, investors aren't buying your company. Early stage seed investors are putting money into the company to help the company grow. And so when they are, are, are putting money into this company, the expectation is they're getting a minority interest, 10%, 20%, whatever of the company. That means 80% is going to you. And why do you get 80% when they're putting in real, there's a wonderful cartoon that I should actually put in this presentation um, in the New Yorker magazine. And it showed two founders going to a VC and, and they're saying, we put our hearts and souls into this company. All we want from you is $10 million, right? So unfortunately <laughs> that $10 million is fungible, which means that you know your, the VC can use it to invest in somebody else or, or go buy a yacht or whatever, right? And so if they're putting that money into your company and you're putting in just your blood, sweat and tears, you know that's not fungible, right? So therefore um, you are expected to put in your blood, sweat and tears. And you're also expected to put in your fungible money that you could be spending on a party or something else. Excellent. Uh, you answered this with your graph, but not directly. Kyle also asks, with angel investors in particular, what is the threshold of the business development before the angels would get interested? Some kind of traction, pre-product, product and market, revenue, et cetera. Right. So angels cover, again, a very wide range, right? And VCs cover a wide range from seed stage VCs and startup folks to later stage VCs. And angels, there are many more of them, and they are individuals, and so they cover an even wider range, right? So there are angels who, who will... Uh, go ahead and, and uh, write a um, you know a, a check on the fly. They'll see you at a cocktail party and they'll and they'll they'll just write a check. Um, there are angels who will spend six months doing detailed due diligence and require all kinds of hoops that you jump through. Uh, in general, um, you will find that professional angel investors, people who call themselves angel investors as opposed to people who make an occasional investment in something, um, will look for traction. Right, and traction, as I said, is something outside of your control. I mean, it can be, you know, typically paying customers would be great, um, but it could be uh, other things um, as well, you know, pilot customers or, or whatever. Um, some angels are willing to, um, you know, invest a little earlier if they think you have an amazing team and proof that you can execute and they know something about the space and they can add real value. Um, but in general, angels are not investing in ideas. They're investing in businesses. And something I thought of in your previous answer too, uh, about, you know, um, the exception proving the rule. A lot of times, like David said, there are, there are bad investors out there. There are bad angel investors, not bad like they're bad people. I mean, those probably exist too, but they're people who are just making mistakes with their money. You can convince a software engineer who makes like $150,000 a year to give you 10 grand to like start something. But if they're not a professional angel investor, chances are down the road, things are less likely to work out. So like David was saying with a lot of the declarations, if you're going after this, the real sustainable business engine of startup investment, you're often spending more quality time trying to go after the legitimate stuff, even though somebody will talk your ear off about you know potentially investing you and writing a check or whatnot, but really educating yourself and approaching the right individuals who can be there with the deep pockets, the support, the network and stuff like that is increasing your chances of success. So I'm sure you can go get a conversation with somebody by the end of the day where they're like, hey, maybe I'd give you money. But, you know, really educating yourself and getting good money, quality money is a, a good thing to focus on. Yep. Quick one, our pitch competition, pinch competitions, would you consider that a hustle round? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Basically, a hustle, a hustle round is anything before you get outside professional investors to doing it. So, you know, you can do a hustle and, and you know, some pitch competitions, you know, give you, uh, you know, a year worth of, of rent and an accelerator. Some of them give you, you know, the the, the, uh, the pitch competition in, um, you know, uh, in Buffalo gives you, it does $5 million a year in prices. There's a whole range of these things out there. Um, so uh, um, the answer is yes, but anything you can get before professional individual investors investing in a in a company. Yep. Um, uh, some great, honestly, we had some great angels in the chat. I don't know if you got to see it, but we had some people from Transatlantic Angel Conference. We had some other uh, angel investors. So they helped with this question, but just so oh, everybody cool. can hear okay. it. How much equity is acceptable to give away in a seed or a series A round or just rounds in general? 
the, the, the typical rule, the rule of thumb historically was 20 to 30%, right? I would say that over per round, and I would say that these days is closer to 20 than 30, right? So the assumption should be that at each stage of your financing journey, uh, you know, you know, 20% uh, is the sort of the target number in there. Um, if somebody wants to, wants half your company for, a, you know, that, that's why some of the Shark Tank stuff isn't really realistic um, because they're, that's a, those economics are not ones you should follow. They're very special over there, right? Uh, so, so that means if you're raising a pre-seed round, right, and you're raising, you know, uh, you know, Two hundred thousand dollars, you know, that then doing that at a you know eight hundred thousand dollar, you know, or you know your your first hustle round or something, you know, taking two hundred thousand in at an eight hundred thousand pre for a million dollar post, not crazy, right? Order magnitude, you know, you would be unlikely to get a five million dollar uh, hustle round or a, or a pre seed round. That you know, the, the average angel round in America is between two and three million valuation. And that's angels. Now that has a lot of, of you know, non-coastal stuff. So it's slightly lower. Coast will be slightly higher. Um, but the valuations are nowhere near as high as you think they are from reading all the social media stuff. Yep. Uh, similar to rounds and pre-seed, is it okay to skip a stage? Oh, not only, is it, not yeah. only is it, is, is it, is it acceptable, <laughs> it is preferred. Um, and so Jason Lemkin um, from Saster has written some great posts about this. And, and it turns out the people, the, the founders who have, have managed to, um, you know, make lots and lots of money on their things have often skipped around. So if you can skip around, you're skipping dilution at the early stages when it's when it's uh, really hurts. Um, and so if you can get, for example, skip the hustle around and when you do it from either bootstrapping or your own cash or something, you know, on the one hand, if it's coming out of your pocket, it's one thing. If you're coming at it from by bootstrapping, that's great. Great. That's why I said that up front. Um, but basically, if you can start raising money, say at the Series A round, without having done a pre-seed round, where you're getting, you know, a, you know, you're giving up 20% of the company at a, you know, an eight million dollar valuation or something, right? That's really great. You've saved yourself a boatload of money. Also, chances are, if you've bootstrapped your way to a Series A round, you either have revenues or some amazing traction or something, you you can negotiate better. So maybe you're selling 15% of your company to just throw fuel on the fire rather than to survive for the next yep, two absolutely. years. Absolutely. The, the, absolutely. The, the, the bootstrapping has so many great things about it, right? You're running lean and mean. You're showing what you can do. You're avoiding dilution. You're retaining control. Um, you are executing and you're setting up the company for great execution, lean and mean. So that's all, that's all really good. Cool. Can, uh, you might have to actually educate me on this one because I don't understand this uh, acronym, but uh, Eric asks, can you discuss the dangers of working with rainmakers who are not licensed? Yeah, IBs? So, so rainmaker. So that's an, another term for finders or intermediaries uh, or whatever is. And the answer is there are a lot of people who claim to do that and you've got to stay away from them. If somebody <laughs> is getting seriously, if somebody is getting compensated for raising money. If somebody tells you, oh, I'll raise you money and either pay me X or I get a percentage of Y, the answer is that's a no-no. It's A, illegal under SEC regulations unless they are a registered broker dealer. That's what investment bankers are. Um, and so you don't pay anybody to raise you money. At the early stages, investment bankers don't work at the early stages. There's a reason. Investment bankers work at later stage companies. When you're talking about angel money, you know, early stage venture money, pre-seed money, hustle around money, this is not, you will not, should not, I will not let you pay any money to anybody for this. Um, and so, uh, if anybody wants to get money from you, run the other direction. Excellent. Uh, hang on. Uh, impact investing. Sandy oh. has been waiting this entire time. What do angels expect in return for impact investing? Are the variables different? Are the expected returns different? Um, Ream okay. on it, because I know this is an area close to your okay. heart, but uh, is, full of this, rationale. This is an area which I have strong feelings. And I've actually, <laughs> um, there's a whole chapter in, uh, I think it's in the start in my book, Angel Investing. I've written two New York Times bestsellers. One of them is Angel Investing, uh, which is the standard textbook for how to be an angel investor that's given out by most angel groups. And the other is the Startup Checklist, 25 Steps to Scale the High Growth Business, which is for uh, founders. Um, I think this is a full chapter in the Angel Investing book. Um, and uh, it's all about, um, impact investing. So impact investing historically has been known as a double bottom line business. The goal of the, of the investment is to do two things. It's to make money and it's to do good for society, right? To have an impact on society. The only problem with a double line, double bottom line business is that you cannot put dollars and societal good on the same graph. 
it, in the same math equation. It doesn't work that way because you, you're not using the same denominator, right? And, and so you can't say, well, one bottom line is good and one bottom, you know, I'm going to do X percent social good, right? Compare with Y dollars. You can't do that trade off. So therefore, impact investors fall into one of two categories. And it's important for them that they know exactly which category they fall into. They are either impact first investors or financial first investors, because that means you optimize for one or the other. So you, in, in, in the case of impact investing, you're optimizing one way and setting a floor the other way. So for example, if I am a financial first impact investor, which I, David S. Rose, personally am, right? I'll say, okay, I am optimizing for the highest possible return I can get. So I will look and do my diligence, look at the company, how much money can I make on this? But I will have a floor for how much you know, social good am I, you know, do I require the business to be in? So, you know, I will not invest in a very profitable business that steals candy from babies, right? I won't, you know, I will, I will, and there are a whole bunch of areas I don't invest in, things that I don't necessarily think are particularly social impact things. I don't invest in beverage deals. I don't invest in gaming or dating things or stuff like that. That's just my personal, you know, craziness, right? I, I try to invest in things, I try to invest in only things that I think are good for society, but I am optimizing for a return. Somebody who is an impact investor, impact first investor, will optimize the other way. They say, I am trying to find the founder or the or the or the venture that is going to have the biggest possible return to society, but I got to get at least X amount of return, right? I'm not looking, it's not a charitable contribution, which will be a gift. I'm trying to make, you know, um, you know, 5% or whatever is or some, you know, not the 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 30x uh, that I'm looking for. I'll I'll settle for a 10x or a 5x or whatever it is, right? But I'm trying to optimize for the most return I can get. So those are two types and understand where your particular investor is coming from, but ultimately the real impact investors turn out to be in many cases be the, the best real investors, financial investors, because they're really smart people and they are looking for a financial return as well as an impact return. So you don't get you don't get a pass for by being for being less successful. Expect <laughs> that anybody who, who is an impact investor will hold your feet to the fire even more than a, than a traditional venture financial investor. And uh, for a follow up in the chat, when you say floor, you mean basically table stakes for you to consider an investment having yeah, it so, has so, to have right. some social positive social impact right. or so, like right. the success so, so, of the company would breed success. Yes. In so so, so in, in my particular case, so the impact impact can be anything from saving lives to improving the quality of life to helping whatever, right? All kinds of things. Um, so in, in my case, I, I use that as a floor, which is there needs to be some benefit, some pro, for, for example, I look at Gus as an impact investment, right? I mean, Gus is certainly trying to make money. We're a profitable company. We've ran for 20 years and we, you know, we're, we're, we're growing and doing really cool things. But I believe that encouraging and supporting entrepreneurship and helping more people get great companies, I think this is a good thing for society. So this is absolutely in my impact universe. Yeah. And so Sandy, for your following question, like David's still looking for 30x returns or the potential for a 30x return in the companies he's investing in. Yeah, there could be some remember, investors. I'm out optimizing there. for yeah. financial return. I'm looking for a 30x, <laughs> but you also have to at least not be bad for society, right? Excellent. Uh, similarly, Alicia asked, uh, where does this is great, where does the IRR come from? You know, if startups take years to get to profitability, how do you actually get ah, a return? Okay. IRR. This, it, it, you can look it up online. It stands for internal rate of return, right? And that would be if you take a value of something at day one and you look at the value of something at day 10 or year 10 or whatever, right? And you say, how has that value changed from beginning to end and backing into if I were getting paid in cash, taking cash out, what, re what return would that give me every year? That's known as the internal, it's internal because you don't get paid out until the end, right? Um, but it's the rate of return, which is each year, how much am I getting? And so therefore, the <laughs> that is from the perspective of an investor. The IRR is totally from the perspective of an investor who is putting money in. And their clock starts ticking the minute they put the money in and it ends ticking the minute they get their money out, right? So realistically, it, and, it, and factored into that, therefore, is how long it takes to get your company profitable, right? If it takes five years before you have any profit whatsoever, but my money is in for five years, yeah, you got to run that IRR against five years, which makes it very, very difficult to, to make money, which means the, the end result at the end has to be really, really big. Another reason why skipping a step and trying to bootstrap makes even more sense, because the, the minute my, my check is written, that starts the clock ticking on the IRR. And specifically, if I could interpret the question in the other way, 
the actual money comes out usually at a liquidation or an exit event where the Correct. company either right. gets acquired right. Right. or IPOs. That's right. when the yeah. investors actually exactly. get their return. So the IRR is, is, is I put my money in and I calculate it at the end what it would be. So for example, if I put you know a thousand dollars in uh, your company and next week you get bought um, for you know uh, you know enough money so I get two thousand dollars back next week, right? I will have only made a thousand dollars in cash, but boy, my IRR will be through the roof because I got it back so fast, right? I can now deploy, and so therefore I can deploy that at the two thousand dollars again and again and again, right? So it is that. So the IRR is the definition of the time value of money. It's how long my money is in and what kind of return do I get over that period of time. Thank you. All right, switching back to hustle fun time, uh, Pieter. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, they've already raised money from 65 investors for about 2% equity. Most are unaccredited or not accredited. So what actually happens? It's a Delaware company. Ooh. Does it get dismissed? Does it? Ouch, 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 ouch. That's a scary fact pattern. That's a really scary, you know, on the one hand, congratulations. I think that you raised that kind of money for that kind of thing. The problem with this is that is so far, you know, uh, you know, sort of out of the out of the the norm here, that realistically, you're going to have to get that cleaned up some way or somehow before any really serious investor is going to invest. Um, and the reason for that is, according to ACC regulations, if you take money in from non-accredited investors, not with a you know a funding platform as we discussed which is legal and has all those kinds of things if you just took cash in and gave them shares of your equity in your company um that's against the regs and what that means is that anybody can who who, who invested that way can go and, and and say oh i made a mistake you didn't tell me or i'm not a credit investor and you took my money anyway so i want my my money back and not only can they get their money back but that can blow up the entire round and you have to give everybody's money back um, for, for, for doing that. And so therefore, no significant real, real investor is going to invest with having 65 non-accredited investors on your cap table. These, that will effectively preclude you from raising any money from anybody. So realistically, you're going to have to go back and clean it up somehow, right? And maybe you can ex post facto clean it up by doing something on one of these crowdfunding platforms and just literally giving people equity through that and putting the cash in. Or maybe you can turn it into loans, which is not equity, but you should be talking. But if you are now at a stage where you're actually looking um, for real investment, <clears throat> you should be getting a lawyer and work with them to clean this up. So I was going to say it's lawyer and accountant time uh, to make forward yep. progress. All right, we got uh, safes. Um, so Kyle, oh, Kyle's been here with great questions. Uh, he has some experience. He's got some old school angels who don't like safes and won't invest when they are used. Any thoughts on structuring a safe to make those kind of investors more <laughs> secure or yeah. maybe just using a convertible note? <laughs> yeah, right. That's Ryan's, Ryan's got it, right? I mean, so if I'm one of those investors who will not, not invest on a safe. Why will I not invest on a safe? If you remember my discussion about safes, I said a safe is like a convertible note, except it takes out those provisions of a convertible note that protected the investor uh, in favor of the company. Um, and the company is doing it for exactly that reasons. <laughs> they don't want to have those, those um, <laughs> you know, provisions that protect the investors. I'm the investor. I want to have those provisions and life is too short for me to do that, right? And so, and I trust myself and I'm a pretty sophisticated guy. So therefore, you know, if, you, if we do a convertible note and we all hope that when we do a convertible note, we have enough of a roadmap and enough of a, of a uh, time frame and headroom that it will work. We will be able to do another round. But if we don't do another round and the note comes due, I'm not going to force into bankruptcy, but I will, you know, I will have the power hand here and we will discuss what makes sense for the company to help you grow and do it the right way. And I'm not giving up that, that kind of power if you can't live up to the terms of our agreement. So the answer is, if somebody doesn't want to do a safe, there's nothing you can do because it, what they don't want to do is what is inherently in a safe. In that case, you should go to a convertible note, which which basically historically for for angels, the question was, do we do a, do a full priced equity route, a convertible preferred shares equity, or do we do a convertible note? And many angels didn't want to do a convertible note. Now, you know, we've lightened up a little bit. And so most angels will do a convertible note. Um, but many of them and many professional angels and VCs will not do a, a save. 
Ah, cool. We're circling back to unaccredited. One, Emily Salberg types in all capitals that this session has been wildly informative. And I don't know if you've been paying attention to the chat, David, but people really like you. Um, so they're in a situation where they've also raised money from a mix of unaccredited and unaccredited, and they're getting into an accelerator. They didn't even consider the accreditation factor. Can an investor become accredited before they actually close out the paperwork? No, because <laughs> no, because an investor is. It, 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 this is like you know. I'm not. There's a good analogy here. I can't think of. But the answer is you either are or you're not. You can't. You can't. But unless somehow that investor gets a million dollars in their bank account, you know, magically, and they're now worth a million dollars, you know, they they are. There, there's no. There's no form you have to fill out saying you know to to be accredited. It's not a, a badge you get. It's a fact pattern. And the fact pattern is, does this person have at least a million dollars in net assets, not including the value of their home? Or does this person have at least $200,000 a year in steady income? If they do, then they're an accredited investor. No paperwork required, no nothing out there. If they don't, they're not. And nothing you can do, including tying four of you together, them together, will make them an accredited investor. Um, so uh, what you can do, depending, as I said before, depending of you know, if you've got uh, 250,000, oh, if you have 250K, the interesting question, however, uh, if that 250K commitment, that's a lot of them. That's a pretty big number. That's a, even a sizable angel round, right? That's 10X mm -hmm. the size of a typical angel round. So I don't see how somebody who is not an accredited investor, in other words, who doesn't have a million dollars, is putting in Two hundred fifty thousand dollars into your into your company. liquid cash. Liquid cash. I mean that that would imply that they're putting a majority of their liquid net worth into your company, which raises a whole bunch of other questions. If you, you know, <laughs> I would not take that from anybody, right? I sold my Bitcoin at the top. <laughs> so 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 a, a so anybody who's writing a two fifty k check is almost certainly an accredited investor. So just verify that with them. Um, you know, typically the way to, the right way to do that is they fill out on what's called an accredited investor questionnaire, um, which asks them all this exhaustive questions about, you know, how would you do that? You know, prove that you're that and, you know, let me see tax returns and whatever, right? Um, and, you know, where does money come from and so on and so forth. As long as, but in real, in reality, you're not going to have that, you know, called into court, right? Unless things go really, really bad. Yeah. So basically just, you know, ask them. You know, here are the rules for an accredited investor over a million in net worth, not including your primary residence, over 200K or 300K by joint in income, as a steady income. Do you qualify as an accredited investor? They'll say yes, and then you're okay. Yeah, and uh, Michael and Thomas in the chat were bringing up some ideas where this is a great time. If you're talking about this amount of money, getting a lawyer to just talk, because when if you take that money, even if they are accredited, you should file a securities exemption where you're going to need a lawyer to. But having that conversation is great because there are some edge case reasons that accredit somebody. Michael was bringing about like officers and various people close to the company can be considered credit. There's some, there's some um, uh, section uh, training that people can take to get accreditation status. So lawyer up so that you can understand and have the confidence that you're taking money from a proper source. All right, uh, back to safes. Um, there's certain language that, um, let, me, let me read this <laughs> more close. There's certain language in the agreement uh, that can be adjusted such that the instrument is treated as stock or not. My questions are, what are your adjustments and you can make in not treating it as stock? Safes are uh, not stock. Yeah, again, say, you know, a safe is this sort of semi-bastard child um, <laughs> that's it's not equity and it's not a loan that was created by Y Combinator to get around the thing for hotshot companies that didn't want to give investors power, right? Um, and so they're, they're just, and there have not been that many of them, you know, done. I mean, it's, it's not uncommon now for a startup, but the, you know, compared to corporations or whatever or security stuff, there, you know, there's been like zero case law on them. Um, and so realistically, you know, you, you know, this is a case where you'd be fighting the IRS, right? Um, and so anybody who would try and claim that, you know, could they claim that it is an equity thing with stock? Maybe their lawyer would be willing to give them a letter of opinion on that. Maybe their accountant would. Probably not because it's not stock. Uh, and so it is what it is. If somebody wants stock, they should, you know, the, the bottom line in all of this early stage financing stuff is you've got two conflicting things here. One is doing it right, legally, cleanly, <laughs> appropriately, covering everybody, keeping your skirts clean, right? And the other is, oh, it's a hustle universe and we got to you know, get cash in however I can get it in, right? And those two things are often in conflict, right? You know, and so you do what you can. And ultimately, if somebody really needs to, if, if they are at a level for whatever reason that they need to have this as a stock investment, 
make it a stock investment, sell them convertible preferred stock, right? Do it as a, as a priced equity round and they'll have stock and you'll have it clean and the company will have a price round and it'll be the best way to do it, right? And if it costs you five or 10,000 bucks in terms of, of legal fees, you know, okay, so. Yep, and to be clear, safes are not stock immediately. They are a security though. So you should do SEC filings appropriately if you're raising funds with them. Um, and I think the, the general thing is like, the less cute you can be about your contracts and documents, the more likely you're not going to get yourself into trouble. The standards exist for a reason because they have tremendous amounts of case law backing them up. So you can very much rely on how things will play out. As soon as you start tweaking little things here and there, you might end up in a contract that's very different than the one that all the case law is based on and your mileage may considerably vary. Uh, this takes me back to our clubhouse days, David. How are security <laughs> tokens disrupting early stage funding? or erupting or Flash, exploding. They are not. Yeah. <laughs> Literally, they are not. Um, there was a brief explosion of ICOs, all of which blew up. Um, security tokens are, you know, in a legal quagmire at the moment as to whether they're securities or this or that, utility tokens, security tokens. Um, the answer is no significant serious investors are raising money in security tokens. And this is not because I'm an old buddy that doesn't know what this stuff. I know this stuff absolutely positively cold. I'm a venture, I am a partner in a uh, blockchain venture fund. But let me tell you, there has been literally zero effect on the real funding world for any kind of start, real startups uh, with security tokens. So don't even consider it. Don't even go there. The world will eventually get to something in the blockchain with all kinds. There are lots of stuff happening and lots of players I'm invested with and doing things are happening, but it's not now. It's not here. Security tokens are not appropriate for early stage fundraising. Banish that from your mind. Excellent. Two things, but I think I'm, I'm going to uh, this is from Amy Schreier. I'm going to put them together because I think your answer might be very similar. What is a good strategy or place to find co-founders? And how do you find advisors with expertise and valuations and exit in your particular industry or consumer media? How do you go find these people, David? Yeah, well, this is, this is one of those things where, you know, you would think, oh, can I go to, you know, uh, advisors.com and find myself an advisor or a co-founders.com? Uh, and you would think you would be able to, and entrepreneurs and founders have been trying for 25 years to create such sites to do that and stuff. But in reality, it doesn't really work that way. Um, and that's because co-founders, you know, really good co-founders who you would want for your company are not just sitting around waiting by their computer for you to say, hey, I've got a company, would you like to co-found it, right? Um, and advisors are doing whatever they're doing to be a good advisor and not waiting for you around to, to do this either. Um, so typically, the best way is to just be involved, hustle, be involved in your industry, whatever industry you, you're in, do you know, read all the blogs, read all of the social media stuff on that find out in news reports, find out about this at this area. Um, and when, you know, if you go on to, to sites that entrepreneurs, you know, hang around in, um, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, various groups on LinkedIn or Clubhouse, which has a very active universe of, of founders and, and pitch rooms and so on and so forth, or uh, there are lots of places where founders gather meetups, your local tech meetups and industry meetups, whatever industry you're doing, that's where you will find people like you who are doing the same thing you were doing and you'll pump into them um, and work with them. You know, accelerators are often good places to uh, to find people. Um, and if you have, if you're in an industry and there are, there is somebody in the industry who is an icon or somebody who is um, experienced and you think they would be a great advisor, ask them. The essence of startup is hustle. Ask, ask, ask. You don't ask, you don't get. And you may be surprised. You may find, you know, it's like nobody ever asked supermodels out on dates. Um, if you, there may be some, some, you know, CEO of, of some, you know, manufacturing company doing X, Y, or Z, who, if you are, uh, you know, in, in a new startup in that, in that area, you might just reach out to them cold and say, hey, I've got a startup here. I'm not looking for money, but I would love to, to be able to, to pick your brains or ask your advice. Might I schedule a call for advice, whatever, right? And you may be surprised they might actually do it. And I, now that being said, Ryan, who is, is feeling this question three times a day, has some other answers here. I mean, you're hitting the spirit of it. Uh, and I even think if you look at where you're at right now, right, we're an hour over time and 72 people are still here in the chat. People were connecting with each other, sharing their LinkedIn profiles. Get out there. Pete and I have been calling it your surface of serendipity. The bigger you can make that surface area, the more likely this stuff is going to happen. Because in reality, what makes startups so exciting is that there is no, you know, paint by numbers solution to building a great company. Something special has to happen in your early, well, 
in all stages of your company's growth. So increasing the chances that something special can happen, whether that's, I mean, we were at a New York Angels holiday party last uh, Wednesday. It's a holiday party. It's not a pitch room. It's not structured. It's people having cocktails and eating things. But I met somebody there who was just about to graduate, who had a startup idea, who was like there because so-and-so invited them from so-and-so to whatever, and they went through a program. And all of a sudden we swap contact information because I have something that like a perspective that might be helpful for that person. This stuff happens all the time. You just got to be there. You got to show up um, to just increase the amount of chances. Uh, oh, by it, the way, by the way, we, we talk often about lawyers and accountants and, and doing it right. Um, and if you try and cut corners and be cute, as Ryan says, you get in trouble. Breaking news, the Trump organization just got convicted. I saw uh, that. So uh, hopefully justice. Um, or who's also been very uh, complimentary asks, when should we start paying ourselves as founders? Oh, good question. The answer is you should definitely be paying yourself as founders after you take money, right? After you, after you take uh, investment money, because investors are investing in the company. And part of the company is paying you a salary. So for, investor, for an investor to put money in the company and own a share of the company, and you not getting paid and contributing your time, you know, that's not fair. Right? Why? Why are you supposed to be investing more of your time for no no additional equity in the company when they're you know uh, because you'd just be supporting them? So the answer. Now that being said, it's an expense of the company, so it should be a and founder salaries are typically a lot less than market rate salaries, quote unquote, for a similar role. But nobody is it is to nobody's advantage for a founder to start. So you should be you know and, and to, while you own the whole company yourself. It doesn't make sense for you to get take out salary and get paid to salary, right? And from a tax perspective, so you don't necessarily take pay yourself, but maybe you accrue it and nominally, so you know what, and, and you should certainly figure it in your salary into your um, your financial projections. Because the minute anybody else other than you has equity in your company, you should be taking a salary. Yeah, that's a good rule of thumb, and you will often find if you have good investors they will help these conversations. And like, even with uh, bumps and raises and things like that, it's not uncommon for the investors to, they basically don't want you worrying about your financial situation. They want you focused on growing your company. So usually it's a below market salary and it'll kind of slowly ratchet up as you raise more money and it becomes, you know, less. It's not a huge figure uh, for the company. Uh, let's see, we got, how can we find, uh, so this actually relates to your previous question about hiring somebody to take somebody to the next level. An idea stage company, can you hire anybody to take your company to the next level? Okay, that's the problem, right? And the, the challenge here is that getting an idea stage, um, an idea to a company, that's the essence of entrepreneurship. That's what entrepreneurs do. And that's why they get the big equity ownership and the big bucks, right? So, you know, in theory, if you are rich enough and you can afford to hire somebody who would otherwise be an entrepreneur and pay them, you know, hundred thousand, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, maybe they would do it. But if they would do it for that kind of money, they're not really an entrepreneur. Um, if you want to bring somebody in as a, you know, as a co-founder, you know, if they're doing the work of getting it to the idea to the functional level, they're really the founder and you may you know, get a, a little piece left you know, for having an idea, but they're doing all the work. The goal of the equity, remember ideas have no value, um, ideas themselves. And so if what you have is just an idea, as wonderful it as, as it may be, there is no value. You have to add to that idea, execution, network, you know, getting the, the knowledge, something to make the company work. And, and so the answer is no, you can't hire somebody to do that. Um, if you're starting a company, because that's what starting a company is all about. And even this is to the next question from Kay Davis is finding finders who will go and set, find, you know, take some portion of the Well, no, the that's exactly, Kay, Kay is asking if you, if you pay them on funds, funds raised, is that okay? The answer is no, that's what's illegal. Yeah. <laughs> the, the SEC says is it is illegal to take money from funds raised for, for raising money from somebody as a percentage of the raise, unless you are a registered broker dealer. That's why people right. register as broker dealers and that's, and they're perfectly allowed to. So if they are a registered BD, there's no problem. You can, they can charge, typically they'll, they'll charge what's known as the Lehman formula, which is X percent of the first, you know, five million and Y percent of the next million and Z percent of the next million and so on and so forth, right? Which is perfectly fine as long as they are a registered broker dealer. But if they are not, then they cannot legally take money. And by the way, that does not work in startup world. I right. will tell you- This is much more private banking, things you know, like that. 
the only ways that makes work, the only people who are licensed who do that, and that's what investment bankers do, and that's only for later stage companies. It is not for seed stage startup. Anybody who is saying, oh, you got a great idea, I'll go out and raise money for you for a piece of the action, doesn't work. That just is not, unfortunately, you have to raise the money yourself. Hustle, accelerators, angels, whatever, right? Uh, crowdfunding, something, but it's gotta be you. You cannot pay somebody to run your company for you. You cannot pay somebody to raise money for you. That's what entrepreneurship is all about. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, this is a great question. I answered Jorge in the chat, but I want you to answer this because you are the angel, the, the super angel investors. They should sign NDAs, right? Otherwise they're gonna spill your secret or they're gonna fund somebody else to run with your idea. This is one of those things that every entrepreneur, including me in my early days, you know, is convinced is the case. And actuality has is completely far from reality, right? So first of all, Seed stage investors do not sign NDAs, period. No angel signs NDAs, no angel group signs NDAs, um, no hustle fund people should sign NDAs, you know, hustle around people. Um, so investors don't sign NDAs. To which your response is, well, 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 they can steal my ideas and that awful, I'm not protected. The answer, the other answer is investors don't steal ideas. I, I know you think it's such a great idea that they should steal it, they would want to steal it and go do it. But in reality, they don't because that's not what they're trying to do. If they wanted to start a company, they would be an entrepreneur, but they're not. They're an investor. If they wanted to fund a company doing this idea, they would find an investor, an entrepreneur who is doing that idea and is committed to doing it, right? If you are an entrepreneur, <laughs> you are doing your own idea. They don't, entrepreneurs don't need somebody else's idea, right? So in, in actuality, when you have a startup, you should be telling everybody, putting it on social media, putting it on your website, casting a, a wide thing here. Nobody cares about what you're doing, really, except you. Your competitors don't care. They're doing their own thing. They're following their own plan. Investors are looking to invest in the best people to execute this plan. So no, do not do NDAs. Investors do not sign NDAs. When you get to the point where you're raising your Series B or something, um, maybe. And if you're, but you know, you don't have to tell people your most intimate, you know, secret thoughts. Your, um, you know, your your pre-patented uh, IP, your um, customer list. You don't have to tell anybody about that kind of stuff. That's trade secret. Keep that secret. But no, they don't sign NDAs. Uh, and also for you, founder's sake, a lot of this stuff also shows your level of awareness and education as being a founder. So if you meet somebody who's interested and then you send them an NDA in the email, you're indicating that you're an inexperienced founder. So it's good yep. to learn yep. these kind of lessons. Absolutely. Uh, we got Donna Lee who says they have an LLC. There's 15 investors who own about 30% of it. Uh, they're thinking about forming a new corporation, seemingly, I'm assuming, for the purposes of this business, but continuing it as an investable. What do we do in this case? All right. So the easy, so the question comes back down to, are those accredited investors, right? Because there is something called, uh, you know, look through. Um, and so you can't disguise non-accredited investors by doing all kinds of shenanigans, right? So assuming those investors are all accredited investors, the easiest thing to do, if, if you can do that, is basically to say that LLC now owns whatever percent of the, you know, 30% of the of the venture. Um, so you own piece and that LLC, that keeps all the investors off in that LLC, lets you as the company deal with just that LLC as one thing. Um, and, you know, somebody has to run it, somebody has to organize it and do all the filings and so on and so forth for it. I assume you're doing that. And so, you know, that's the easiest way to do it. You know, alternatively, you could uh, get a lawyer and swap their LLC interests into, um, you know, direct interests in whatever uh, in whatever vehicle you're using for funding a new company. That's that shouldn't be a problem, but you now do require a lawyer. All right. Uh, would you say how much time do you have left, David? Um, this is what I do, right? So <laughs> I know. This, this, this is my this is my give back. I like it. Uh, would you say that investors primarily lean to convertible notes and consider safes only if the upside is really good? It's an interesting variant on a question, but I, I think very, very I, question. The, the, the answer is um, investors, real investors primarily lead to uh, convertible preferred stock to what's known as a priced equity round where they are buying this that magic stock I told you about, which is uh, starts out as preferred stock and they can convert to common stock when, when needed. Um, so that's what all VCs do. That's what all serious large investment rounds are based on. Um, series A, Series B, Series C are all convertible preferred stock. 
Um, so many angels historically prefer to invest in that. Convertible preferred stock at a fixed price and fixed valuation so you know exactly what part of the company you have, your other cap table and so on and so forth. Um, because doing that is slightly more expensive and complicated than um, uh, doing a, a convertible note, um, you know, probably beginning 10, 15 years ago, uh, investors began to say, okay, I'll do um, a convertible note instead. So for angels, it's typically between a, a you know, convertible preferred stock or a you know, convertible note. Um, safes, as we said before, are um, for the benefit of the company, not the investor. And so if an investor doesn't want to do a safe, you're not going to get them comfortable with doing a safe because they're not comfortable doing a safe. <laughs> a safe doesn't give them, you know, debt that they can enforce. It doesn't give them a payback and, and, and doesn't give them, you know, it, the very, the reason you would want to do a safe is the reason they wouldn't want to do a safe. And there's nothing you can do by giving them a safe that would make it better or more attractive to them to do a safe. So if they, so either decide doing a safe is more important to you and you don't need them as an investor and go to somebody else, or if you really need them as an investor and they won't do a safe, then do it as a convertible note. Sorry, I muted. Something fell over on my desk. Everything went chaotic, but it doesn't sound like it disrupted you guys. Um, how do you compensate advisors? You don't have any money. It's early on. Uh, there, the Founders Institute actually has a pretty good uh, set of um, uh, docs about this, which basically, uh, so advisors are typically um, uh, compensated in equity, right? They have um, a, uh, you know, they have stock, either restricted stock or op if you have an option plan, um, you have, <clears throat> you can give them options in your option plan. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the rate that they get uh, compensated with equity depends sort of on uh, value of the company, on how much they're, you expect them to do, how much they do do. The, the template from the Founder Institute is pretty good uh, about uh, establishing guidelines for them, for what they're, you're expecting from them, what they're expecting to do, or what period of time, how much they should invest over that period of time. But it's typically vesting equity, you know, anywhere from half a point to a point or two over two to four years. Yep, and equity, uh, a big warning, if an advisor is asking for cash, that's not an advisor, that's more of a contractor with services and things like that. Exactly. Most yep. advisors are skin in the game upside, they're experts that are going to help your startup get to the next level, not usually through direct contribution, but through advice, network connections, things like that, and they should only get equity compensation. Yep. Not that they can't switch to being a contractor at some point if they're kind of doing both, but just make that clear. If anybody's well, like, give mentors, me cash for mentors, my... Mentors are not paid. Exactly. Men mentors are not paid. And, you know, uh, so anyway. And perfect segue into Sandy's, which is, I think we just answered, can I issue advisors common stock um, if you're getting them in the early days? Totally. It's often a lot cheaper than an option. You know, yep. once you get an option plan, you have some calendar obligations to handle with stock options and whatnot. It's usually far safe and easy to do common stock grants when things are early and cheap. Right. And the answer is right. Absolutely. So that's the way to do it. Right. So you don't want to give uh, advisors the kind of stock that investors get. Right. Because remember, the whole purpose of investors getting convertible preferred stock is to make sure they get their cash back. An advisor isn't putting in cash. So you don't want to get them cash back. Right. If there's no thing. So you would typically compensate them either in common stock, which you can do early on. Uh, Gus has forms of stuff for that. Or if you have an option plan, you can give them options on common stock. Awesome. Uh, Emily's back. Once you take in some money, do you suggest onboarding an accountant or accounting team? Um, you know, I guess really the question is when to actually start paying accountants, um, yes. knowing that you're yes. bootstrapping yes. yourself. Yes, the, the answer is this is one of those penny wise and pound foolish things, right? You want to get an accountant and you want to get a lawyer the minute you have any cash in there, right? Find good ones who are not going to be expensive, not going to break the bank. But, you know, if you pay, you know, a couple of thousand and, and a big accounting firm, charge a lot of money, but you don't need a big accounting firm, right? You get somebody who specializes in startups. There are various services that will work with, with startups, right? So, you know, and if you end up paying, you know, 5,000 bucks a year for an accountant and, you know, 10 or 15,000 bucks a year for an attorney out of, you know, the, the 500,000 or whatever is you've raised, that's money well spent. And I just posted a link to one of our partners, clear.tax. They just rebranded. They used to be GBS tax. Gus Launch, you get, if you're a Gus Launch customer, you get $25 or $250 off their, their tax services. You do not want to file your company's taxes on your own. It's much more complicated than your personal taxes. And bookkeeping will literally save the day. Some, like David said, Pennywise Pound Foolish. I have heard stories of so many companies going out of business 
for accounting errors. They didn't realize they needed to pay a certain tax. They didn't realize they needed to be registered in a certain thing. And all of a sudden their obligations are more than they had. The whole business model was upside down, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, let's see, Mike says, would it be poorly uh, considered if you paid yourself as a consultant? Uh, we get this one a lot. So you consult to your own startup to, to pay yourself instead of paying yourself a salary. In reality, the, although it's standard to pay yourself a salary, the question is, you know, first of all, why, right? What, 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 is, what do you think the benefit is to paying yourself as a consultant instead of a salary, right? I mean, either way, you're ultimately paying taxes on income. Um, if for whatever reason your accountants and, and attorneys advise you that there is, it makes sense to somehow pay you as a, as a, you know, through an LLC or as a consultant or something, you know, that's fine. As, so the, the, the technical form of that is irrelevant as far as the uh, company is concerned and investors are concerned. You damn well better be the full time CEO getting paid a full time CEO salary and not doing this as a side gig, right? So the question is, why would you want to be paid as a, it's, it's a, it, anything that raises eyebrows or is not usual? Is there's no reason to do it. The whole essence of Gus was built around doing things in a mil spec way, in doing the in the standard way that people have done for decades, and they know why they're doing it, they know how it works. And anytime you depart from that, unless there's a really, really good reason, it raises eyebrows and is one additional check mark X mark against you, right? And so, you know, we often see founders, first-time founders come in with all kinds of cockamamie ideas <laughs> about how they should structure this and fund this and own the IP here and 10x voting and rights. Positive. And, you know, and, and the more you have of that, you're effectively guaranteeing you'll never get funded, right? Because, in, in, you know, investors who do these kinds of early stage things are used to doing these, these standard ways. There are reasons, very good reasons why things are being done this way. It matches what you think you're doing. So having paying a CEO as an advisor doesn't match with reality what's happening. There may be an occasional circumstance where for some bizarre tax reason, it makes sense, but I can't off the top of my head imagine it. So we have two questions now. Um, that are very fun. I believe T. Raymond asked, what does Gus get out of this? And Sande just asked, what does Gus get out of this? I think it's both this presentation that we're doing right now and all the stuff that we offer in general. So I, I would love to hear your take on, <laughs> on this, David. Because we're big fat marshmallow suckers in this one because we just love entrepreneurs, right? No, we're, we're, what, the question is why am, I, why am I doing this whole thing here? Because I'm a sucker, because I spend half my time, you know, teaching and writing and giving back. I have been very, very fortunate in life in every which way you can think of. Um, I am an entrepreneur. I'm a fifth generation entrepreneur, uh, turned third generation angel investor. So, you know, I know as much about this as anybody on the planet probably. Um, and so my social, as I told you before, I regard Gus as an impact investor. Right. Our goal is certainly a, a finance first impact investment. Our goal is to make as much money as we can and go public and whatever. Right. But, you know, it, but still it, it, we're having an impact and the impact we're having. I believe that entrepreneurs are the engine motive power of the world uh, and are the, are the force for good and the force for creating everything here. And this is my goal to give back. And so, A, it's my giving back. B, it's healing the world. Uh, Takuna Lam, if those of you who know the, the, what that means. Um, but, uh, but more than that, for in terms of very pragmatic approach, Gust is in the business of supporting entrepreneurs and helping to build the entrepreneurship ecosystem. And so doing this, we've had, you know, 500 people sign up for this thing. We had 175 or whatever is who were here Almost for 90. Months. You know, 190. You know, we've now got we're now into our second or third hour, and we've got 70 people still here. So hopefully, you think that this is useful. And if you're still here, hopefully, you think kindly of, of Gus and us. Hopefully, this shows you that we know what we're talking about. And when we suggest that you do things on our platform, there's a reason for why you've done it that way. So those are all good. It builds our brand. It's it's good for marketing. And and way Gus makes money. You know, we were you know the the original thought was, oh, we're building the infrastructure for the ecosystem. And if we if we are in the middle of this whole thing, you know, as companies become unicorns, we'll get our piece, which was great, you know, didn't quite work out that way. Um, and it turns out that there are a lot of lot more startup companies who, um, you know, try and start and, and don't succeed than the ones who become unicorns. Um, but we've never given up our, our love and support for the earliest stages of starting people. And so we created uh, the whole category of CAS, C-A-A-S, Company as a Service. So Gus Launch is the first and best of the company as a service platforms, where if you are a founder who is looking to start a company, you can come on, you press a button, and we literally spin up the company to all the stuff we're talking about, um, from incorporating you the right way and setting up your legal structure the right way and setting up your board and doing it in the right location and qualifying you in the right states, and then um, you know, providing equity to your, to your founders and your co-founders and your advisor agreements and, um, and building your cap table and introducing it to your lawyers and helping with your tax 
taxes. And then ultimately, as you grow and you, you, we do your option plan for you and, and manage your whole equity cap stack and everything else. Uh, and for that, we get paid. It's, you know, we get paid so little that we should, we should probably <laughs> we should. charge a lot more. But I mean, Maybe the, we should the, entry their price, prices. I mean the entry price is $300, you know, $300 to get your entire company incorporated, your whole setup, your board, your cap table, all that kind of stuff. I mean, literally, you know, we joke internally, it's sort of an IQ test that if, I mean, if, if you're a startup founder and you don't do that for 300 bucks to get started the right way, there's something probably wrong and you're probably not worth <laughs> the investment. You know, they, m- most people, you know, take the, take it to the next level, which is is um, the Accelerate uh, plan, which is for $1,000 a year, gives you something like $100,000 worth of credits against everything from Amazon Web Services to you know, an hour a month of legal services to discounts on all kinds of, of startup tools and uh, all the advisory agreements and fundraising stuff there. Again, it is, it is such an enormous cost-benefit uh, you know, uh, ratio there um, that it makes perfect sense. So the answer is we make our money and we're a profitable company. We make our money by providing tools and services um, to investors on the one hand and startup companies on the other hand, as they grow these giant companies. Yeah, and we're truly, we're like a software as a service company. Like we, we do not take equity in other people's companies. We do not run their investments for us. We have thousands of companies that sign up every month. We can't possibly, and I know a couple of you asked like, hey, review my company, tell me what it's like. And I sent you a link to how to get a meeting with David S. Rose, a blog post he wrote like 10 years ago. That is actually a really great resource, but we get to sit in the, uh, what is, like we can pass the red face test by providing tools, services, and education and the ability to have serendipitous things happen. But we are not the agents doing it. We're not broker dealers. We're not your private bankers. We're not anything like that. Because we believe literally spreading more of this around and making it freely open and available to pretty much any way is as much as we can charge to keep the lights on and do stuff like that will be a net good for the world. But if you want a Delaware C Corp and you want it to run nice and clean and you want it to be invited to more events like this and get more connections and actually make the right decisions, we would love for you to be a Gus Lodge customer. All right. Uh, it's hard to find a co-founder. Uh, this is in how, uh, to start the business. Uh, can you do it without a co-founder? Sure. Can you, uh, again, can you start without a co-founder? Absolutely. Right. I mean, I started Gust as a, as a solo founder. Um, that being said, Founding a company is a really emotionally draining, highly stressful thing that requires an enormous number of separate skill sets all coming into play. And while it's possible, life is just, you know, A, it's easier as a founder if you have a co-founder who you can trust and who is as committed as you are to the event. Um, the, the guy who founded Y Combinator um, noted that uh, he only invests in teams that were that had a pair of co-founders, a hustler and a hacker. By that, he meant somebody who was the sort of product techie guy who's building and running the company, operating the company, and a hustler who's going out there raising money, doing the sales and marketing, and so on and so forth, right? So that's typically the way these pairs break down. If you think about Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak founding Apple, or Bill Gates and Paul Allen founding Microsoft, or Larry Page and and Sergey founding um, Google, um, founding a company is often a lot easier if you have a co-founder with complementary skills, but it's certainly possible to do it as a single founder. And co-founders can always join it later. Nothing is as appealing as something like traction to join it. You're going to pitch everybody your startup, whether it's an investor, the founding team, their advisors, your eventual customers. Um, so it might not be the same thing as two people hacking and hustling together and like sharing 60, 40 or whatever the split is. But if you can just show that grit and hustle and get something up in the process, you might meet somebody that ends up being a 10% you know, owner of the company and acts like a co-founder in a slightly later stage. So getting started is probably the best thing you can do uh, to find a co-founder or anybody to join you. Yep, absolutely. Uh, I don't know if you know this, although Chad Midnight is asking this, who might be the coolest name I've encountered on this Q&A. Uh, do you know if there's similar things like the SBIR in Canada? I'm pretty sure there are. I'm pretty sure there are. I don't know what they are off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure they are. Yeah, I actually think Canada is a little bit more generous because they've been trying to foster an innovation ecosystem rivaling, well, they've been looking at their uh, southern neighbors and being like, we can do this too. They just happen to lack a population uh, it's on par with the American thing. But I know NACO is a great Canadian organization that does a lot of the angel uh, group stuff. And we have a, one of our Gus Launch founders, Lee Honeywell, who is actually pretty much an expert on Canadian stuff, has moved to Canada recently and found there's a bunch of money out there from the Canadian government and things like that. Uh, so check it out. Find Lee Honeywell on Twitter. She tweets about this stuff quite a bit. All right. Would you say that creating a secondary LLC and making an investor or license the software developed to the C-Corp would be better than... <laughs> no! Already making it cute. <laughs> no! 
<laughs> no, that's the, that's the getting cute part we talked about not doing, right? No, for God's sakes, do something absolutely mill spec right down the middle. Every time any every time you layer on anything, especially something like that, where you have the IP here and you're licensing this to there and you're raising funding, that will literally kill you. You will never, ever, ever get funding. The getting cute is the worst thing you can do. It, and it, and it, it's, un, you know, you think that it shouldn't be and you think you have a good idea about how to do something or be creative. It turns out, for the founder, this is your first time founding a company and it's all new and you're all, you know, brand new starting and coming in and looking for investors. On the other side of the table, for investors who do this kind of stuff um, on a regular basis, you know, who see, I mean, New York, Gust, see Gust on the inbound side, get something like 10,000 companies every month, right? And New York Angels is why one angel group probably gets 250 companies every month coming in. We do this all the time. We see all these companies and what you, and, and the most important thing is, is the company going to make it to be unicorn, right? That, that's the goal. And, and that's a combination of the execution and luck and market timing and the founder and all the other things about the company. The last thing we want to do is complicate it by all these weird structures that we got to think about, spend any brain cells on, pay any lawyers to look at or anything else. You know, all of the regular stuff, the reason that Gus abstracts this into a very simple standard thing is because it's what everybody knows, everybody understands, and we don't have to think about it, right? Because if I have, because the, if you if you think that you are competing with 40 other companies, four zero for an angel round, if I look at these and say, oh, this guy's got a cockamamie thing with he's licensing with LLC or whatever, Frank, forget him next. And I'll look at the other 39. <laughs> Excellent. Um, this is an interesting one. Would would an investor prefer a pitch deck or an MVP? I think we've answered yes. this in many ways. <laughs> yes, the, the answer please. is yes, right? Uh, <laughs> so, so if you're talking to investors, investors need a pitch deck. You know, the, the, uh, investors need a pitch. You need to, uh, the pitch is where you explain to investors what you're doing and why they should invest, right? And so typically, you know, can you do it without a pitch deck? Can you just do it live? Yeah, you can, but why would you, you know, you can also go through life hopping on one foot. Why would you want to do that and, and handicap yourself, right? Um, so the, the, again, the accepted standard in this field is a pitch deck, a PDF or PowerPoint or keynote um, deck that has, you know, that lays out the answers to the questions investors ask. And if you, investor asks a question and you don't have the answers there, you know, you, I mean, you know what questions they're going to ask. They're going to ask about your team and your market size and your product and your solution and your customers and your business model and so on and so forth. So the pitch deck pulls all this together and answers their questions before they even ask them. And they expect that you know that. They expect you'll have a deck. So yeah, they expect a pitch deck. And then the MVP gets to the traction thing. Since investors don't fund ideas, you better have, you know, I don't know how you get traction without an MVP, but you know you can try it, but that's not what they fund. Uh, exactly. Uh, so we talked a lot about advisors, where to find them, how to compensate them, but how important are they when you're just getting started? The answer is it's they are primarily important to you. If you have valuable advisors who really are adding value to you, that's great. Um, they provide some little level of seasoning when you go out to, uh, you know, for raising funds. And particularly if you are a first time founder with no real background, no real track record, you're maybe a young founder and you have an advisory board, which has well-known names, industry heavyweights or people who have experience that can help compensate in some way, not all the way, but a little bit for your inexperience, right? Um, but even in my, my latest venture, um, I have, you know, an insanely, I'm a CEO, I have an insanely great management team, which is wonderful. And we have a killer board of advisors and the board of advisors there, it doesn't make up for not having management team or not having a good business or anything else, but it, it certainly doesn't hurt and it's helpful. And so the first and most important thing for advisors is will they be advising you and helpful to you in creating and growing the business? And then the second is, will their name value help, you know, investors have confidence that you know what you're doing? I think we're at the last question, oh, uh, yeah. and it's a it's a perfunctory one. So, what is the uh, well, what is the way to incorporate in the U.S. if the parent company is registered abroad? You see this guy named Ryan Nash. Ryan, yeah. the... <laughs> I was going to say I could answer this one. Uh, so, the fun thing about Delaware specifically, if we're talking about high growth startups, is they will take you from anywhere. Delaware is more than happy to collect your annual franchise tax for being unregistered in Delaware. You know, doing your activities. Hey, maybe someday you'll actually pay uh, big amounts of tax. So you can start a Delaware C-Corp from anywhere. What happens next 
is where you have to get involved with lawyers uh, because it is very viable and this happens all the time. There are accelerators purpose built to help companies do this to get exposure to the US market and then US investment. I would check out Lat LATAM Hub in Toronto. They help uh, Latin American companies get into Northern exposure through Canada because Canada has some facilities. There's International Accelerator whose entire thing is you have success in a small market, but international and you want to replicate that sex and success in the US. But the long and the short of it is legal documents. You can set up the entity just fine with Delaware. You can use us to do it. You can get incorporated. But then the agreements that you need to structure afterwards to give investors confidence to invest in that U.S. company is going to depend on where you're coming from. So you're probably going to want lawyers on both sides of the ponds or oceans or wherever um, to come up with convincing legal structures between that existing entity and your new Delaware entity so that the investors, the biggest thing is giving the investors confidence that a dollar that they put into Delaware C-Corp for fractionalized ownership will appreciate in value if the international activities are appreciating in value in a commensurate and equal way. But it's going to be legal work. Uh, by the way, there is a brand new book um, all about exactly how to do this, how to do a startup uh, in the U.S. from overseas. Uh, it just came out. Um, Ooh, who's I, the actually, author? Uh, I will give you the link. I am humiliated to say I don't recall, especially since I said it's after uh, and, I, and I blurbed it. So I will, <laughs> we will make sure to put it in the link. But it's actually a, a really good book about going through all the intricacies of, of, of corporate setup for an international founder. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Sometimes you'll hear it called a flip is a lot of times success in a small but international field and then wanting to go into the U.S. exposure. Um, but yeah, it's definitely possible. It's just you're going to want you're going to want legal help. But I'm I'll, heck, I'll read that book. I deal with enough international founders day in and day out that I could probably be uh, better educated on how to do it. Cool. Excellent. And I think that marks it. We still have oh, 53 right. people that hung out with us for two and a half hours. <laughs> Well, so uh, so there is so they deserve some kind of reward, Ryan. Here, ooh, can we can we, yeah. can we what, what what can we give the, the fifty five participants who have managed to stick through God two and a half hours um, of of my uh, bloviating? Um, yes, I mean something. we can we will definitely pass on a discount link just for showing up to Gus Launch if that's in your future. But maybe we can get creative and do something that'll be you know because it might not be applicable to everybody here. But definitely, I've got the Zoom analytics. I can figure this out. Um, tomorrow in the oh. fall, you'll get a special follow on email if you're here in this chat right now, um, at least with a discount link, if not with, oh, I can send them your audiobook uh, for oh, free. Yeah, I believe right, I have rights to that, idea. right? Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, do that. Great, a, a discount on, look at that, guys, see, you stay for two and a half hours listening <laughs> to me and you get a discount on Gust and a free copy of the audiobook of my uh, startup checklist, so. Excellent, yeah, we're allowed to, to get that out. So look out for that. If you're here right now, I will mark the time. Uh, we'll just do it 5.30. If you stay till 5.30, if you're still on the thing, uh, we'll send out a special follow-up for that. And excellent. Any uh, any last words, David? Parting words? No, it's it's been, you know, the, we love entrepreneurs, obviously, which is why we do this. Um, and we've had a lot of experience, which I think shows from what we've been talking about today. The kind of stuff we've been telling you and sharing with you are, these are lessons that have taken us, you know, 10, 20 years to learn. Um, and, you know, the, the, the few things, if there are a few takeaways from here, right? It's number one, investment is all about business and it's all about the company. You saw the difference between the two kinds of businesses, right? Which is really, so the critically fact number, critical fact number one, two kinds of businesses, the independent, small independent business and the high growth startup. Two different things. Figure out which one you are. Either is perfectly fine, but they get financed differently. They operate differently. The fundamentals are completely different. Number one. Number two, if you're going the high growth startup route, don't be cute. As Ryan said, and we've said multiple times, none of this licensing, cross stuff, hiring different, but just do it the right standard way. That's what Gus Launch is all about. And that's what investors see. Effectively not doing it that way shoots you in the foot and you won't get funded. And there's no reason to shoot yourself in the foot. Number three, investing is not some arcane thing, investing in startups. It's not some magic. It's not some secret in group where only dead white rich males, you know, invest in other ones out there. Um, it, it is it is not some, you know, all about who you know. It really, really, really isn't. It's not because and people don't invest in you. It's not because they don't like you. I mean, for God, for my first probably 10 years as a, as a founder, I was convinced that people didn't invest in me. It's because they didn't like me. I was I talked too fast or I was too much of a New Yorker or they didn't like redheads or whatever, <laughs> you know, but and, and they were discriminated about it. They didn't like my fit, whatever. It was all personal. 
It really is not. It's not personal. It's just business. That's really true. This, it, and because this, what you're coming into is an industry with lots of investors and lots of flow through. Um, the uh, you know a, a analogy to think about it is a, a stream and a fish in this stream in this fast moving stream is swimming in here and the stream moves by and so everything is new as the fish comes by this this stream. Every place he's going is new. Um, but meanwhile, there's a fisherman who comes to the edge of this bank. Every every day to fish and sits by this tree and puts his fishing pole. And so as far as the fisherman is concerned, it's the same old, same old every day. Every day he knows there'll be a thousand fish swimming down the thing right in front of him, right? And he knows what that's like. And for the fish, everything is brand new because he's never seen this river before and he's coming, coming through. And that's much what it's like um, with founders and, and investors, right? The investors do this all the time. There are ways to do it. There are standards. They are looking at this versus that. There are so many fish in the sea that they are looking on a comparative basis. And in the real world, we live in a Darwinian society. This is the essence of capitalism, right? Uh, and the essence of a free market capitalist system is that you know uh, those companies that can succeed and do well will get funded. And people are investing not as charities, and even impact investors are investing for a financial return. And so, therefore, if the business is deserving of financing, if it is a successful, fast growing, high growth business that will make a lot of money, right? Then it will, assuming that you don't do anything crazy, and you have standard <laughs> structures and stuff, it will get funded. You will get funding. And on the other hand, if what you have is a business that should not get venture capital because it's a kind of traditional high growth, you know, independent business that should be funded in a different way, or because it's a stupid thing that, that has little chance of getting, you know, uh, growing no matter what you think about it, right? Then it won't get funded and you can spend all day long trying to do it. So the, the goal for, for raising money is not to be something you're not, not to pretend to be something or put a gloss on it or a, a fancy graphic or something. Um, it's, to, it's to clearly be a business that is worthy of funding and make that clear to your investors. And so we love entrepreneurs. We love investors. Investors are for the most part here to help entrepreneurs. Good luck with your business. You are the future power of the world. And we think Gus can help. So check us out, gus.com, read the books, check all the resource pages, and more than anything else, go out and hustle and just do it. Start your company. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, everybody, who stuck this out. This was fantastic. Be on the lookout for more stuff from us. Uh, this this was going to wrap our Founder Prepare curriculum, and I think it ends the year in a, a wonderful way. We will have some follow-on programming, so check your email. We'll have a newsletter out tomorrow that will highlight that programming, too. And hang out with us for the new year. We're going to do launch. We're going to have a whole theme about launching your company from the ground up. David will be back. We'll have some more exciting uh, presentations, more materials. We'll send you tons of stuff. Um, thank you again, David. Have a great I'm evening. Close. Somebody in France says it's too late. <laughs> they stayed up late listening <laughs> to David and Ryan. <laughs> All right. Thanks again. Have a great week, everybody. I know. Bye.